There's one person above all others who's critical to the smite scene. Every time, first one in, last one out. This guy's just in every single replay. This guy is a madman, a certified psychopath. Every real moment of smite includes him. I mean, the broadcast wouldn't be the same without him. Number one MVP, without a doubt. to the Alienware Lounge here for the 2019 Smite World Championships Grand Finals. That's the energy I'd like to hear everyone joining me at Zeros F. and Tolly, and it has been an incredible Smite World Championships. I said this in day one that that might have been the most intense day one action we've ever seen. There's definitely been a lot of predictions and then a lot of unexpected events, I would say, in this HRX. Not just the day one, the day two was absolutely incredible. I mean, we watched the, everything that the teams were able to do. And, uh, you know, I hate to kind of do it, but the, the crowd is absolutely insane this weekend. <laughs> right to be excited because we have two incredible teams coming up. It's going to be Rival versus SK Gaming. And before we get into the first match, we have to look at the journey that SK took to get here. Anatoly, tell me a little bit about the placement rounds that we yeah, saw. Yeah, so SK Gaming finishing off in the seventh seed of the SPL. Phase one and phase two, going four and five in each of those, having to go through the placements. Did not get knocked down into the lower bracket. And then, kind of really surprising everyone in day number one, beating out Splice, Beating out also Renegades in day number two in that reverse sweep. They had to overcome Sanguine in the placements to get to that second, or rather the first seed out of the placements. Zeros, is this something that you expected, though? I think everyone kind of expected the seventh seed to be able to make it through the placement rounds. Yeah, for sure. I, I had them as my top team going through the placement, but I did not expect them to beat Splice and then <laughs> Renegades after. What is going on, man? I think everybody's bracket was fine with SK in placements. I think everybody's bracket is busted with SK in finals. Well, let's take a quick look at those brackets that we got to see starting from day one. Of course, Team Rival beating out Sanguine 2 and 0. Oh, and then Dignitas versus PK going 2 1 in the way of Dig. Splice versus SK Gaming, the big upset of day one with 2 1 going in the way of SK. And then, of course, Renegades versus EU United 2 and 1 in the way of Renegades. But yesterday in the semifinals, we saw Team Rival again not lose a single game against Dignitas. Was that something that you expected, Tolly? Definitely not. I had Dignitas going all the way, actually winning this whole tournament. Unfortunately, they ran into the brick wall that was Team Rival. And then SK versus Renegades, where we thought it could have been another 3-0 stomp. And this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, I think Ataraxia said this online, this is the first reverse sweep we've seen in a best of five. Yeah, it, it's pretty incredible. In the world stage, it's, it's even more of an incredible task. And I'll be honest, I mean, Renegades were so hot, uh, the way they hit mid-season Invitational. This was, I, Renegades were my pick for finals, for the whole damn thing. And to see SK come back down 0-2, I mean, you can't write that story. Well, if you guys did miss the incredible games yesterday, let's take a quick look at day number two. Hi-Res Expo. The easy games are over. Best of fives, everything left on the battlefield. First up, Team Dignitas versus Team Rival. Rival, historically, a strong team with a strong leader. Looking across the way, Dignitas, they have an interesting history. 
but altogether one of the stronger teams on the map. That said, Polar Bear Mike is one hell of a leader. And to say this was clean would be putting it lightly because they swept the hell out of Team Dignitas. Next up, the easy bet. Renegades take the field versus SK Gaming. Renegades, one of the best teams we've seen all year. SK Gaming, on the other hand, a team fledgling. The middle of the pack all throughout the regular season. They make their way through placements and earn their seat at the Spite World Championship. I, Raffer, and Renegade sit down. SK Gaming, the placement team, are in the finals. The Smite World Championships 2019 Team Rival versus SK Gaming. Introducing Team Rival, The Hunter, Arkle. One, blow it up. The captain and support, Polar Bear Mike. Stand by three. Send him out. The mid laner, Panda Cat. And our next one. The jungler, Captain Twig. the island in the solo lane it's fine okay <laughs> and the coach of team rival slady Introducing Team SK Gaming! In the hunter position, Z -Z 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 <laughs> The team captain in the support role, Neil Ma! In the jungle, Sam for Sucker! <laughs> Rounding out SK Gaming in the solo lane. Belair! And their coach. It's Chuck!
Welcome back, everyone, to the Alienware Lounge here, where unfortunately, due to some issues with Persephone, we do have to restart our draft. We understand your frustrations, and we really do appreciate your patience, everyone. But now, going back into Rival versus SK Gaming, game number one. Now, we do have to talk about the issue. Now, Persephone being perma-banned for this match. What exactly does that mean for our teams? It's going to change a lot of the picks and bans. Rival was able to secure that for themselves, but now they're going to probably go for something a little bit more space control, more lane pressure early. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Panda Cat actually go for an early mid-game Hunter, probably the on her, actually. I think the Persephone ban, though, is definitely favoring Rival. We've seen Paul and Persephone being so good on it. It's been a must-ban against him every game, or if you don't ban it, you first pick it as Rival did this game. So an advantage, but we'll see what happens here. Well, it looks like it is time to go into picks and bans of game number one. Jumping right into it, everyone. What are some of the first bans we're going to be seeing? Clearly not Persephone. I think Rival again. They're definitely going to ban the Morrigan. Yeah, there is. And I think it's, they're just going to run it back, I think. They're going to ban the Morrigan, they're going to ban the Hal, and they're going to ban the Uller. And probably first pick the Isis this time instead of Persephone. But this makes me think that SK might just ban out the Isis this time around. So I don't think you want to give out that one up for free. I think they left it up last time because they knew they'd get the trade. Yeah, I think that absolutely might come into play. We'll take a look if Isis actually winds up there. I'm really questioning if Rival is going to continue doing what their plan was in in the first try, right? Because it was a it wasn't a surprise kind of cheese. Oh, we have the Odin last pick, but it was specifically, I think, a one game scenario. So I'm curious to see if they go back to the drawing board or if they bring the same strategy. Yeah, it'll be interesting. You guys said before that Rival definitely had that early game composition, but Merlin being banned for Rival now instead of Persephone. A little bit of a switch up here. Paul is certainly not happy about that, throwing his hands in the air. Now, this makes a lot of sense because Rival was banning away the help because they didn't want to deal with the Persephone versus Hell matchup. So now with Persephone no longer but Hell available, through. this makes a lot of sense. Does this mean that we're going to see a Hell pick? Not necessarily, actually. Oh. SK don't have to pick Hell just because it's up. Yeah, I think they will, though, because, like, Paul Scott Pool, as we said, it's, now it's definitely big enough, but Persephone being out of it now, that's one less to add to it, but they leave the Hell open for some up. reason, and I'm pretty sure he'll pick it here. Here, I think we see the, the on her. I think the on her was going to be important. But it's the Sarkat snatch away. I love this Sarkat. PBM on Sarkat is very dangerous, very loose. Hard to really contain in your own jungle. And something that Neil did well at the beginning of that game was invade the speed buff. A lot easier to do on the Sarkat as opposed to the Xing Qian. Also, Sarkat really good against Isis. Her ultimate completely negates healing, right? So, like, Isis can't get the healing from her ultimate. So, a good counter pick to Isis as well, the Sarkat. Do you guys see now with the picks that we have? Thor finishing out the first picks with Erling Shin as well for Rival. Are they still going for that early aggression or is this going to be a completely different game plan? Definitely similar game plan. Instead of the Erlong, it was the circuit earlier on. So still looking for some aggressive options. Yes! Yes! I know that it sucks to have a game reset, but I don't know if we're going to see hell for the rest of the grand final. So I'm kind of happy that we get to see her now. I mean, you've been the OG hell fan since I, I, is it Hell or Yamina who's number one in your heart? Oh, why you gotta ask me that, man? <laughs> ha, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know, I, it doesn't matter. Who cares what I like? Let's go back into the bands here with Dodgy and Servers being banned out. Not two bands that we saw in the uh, original draft. Right, I think these are a couple of different control-oriented options, and so we wanted to see them banned out because the, those are multiple, uh, Cerberus and Daji will be able to pick up multiple people. Hell with the Clans is looking for single target CC. The more single target CC you select on Rival, the more opportunity Paul gets to show off. SK Gaming are predicting that this Erlong is going in the jungle, and that's why they are banning away the support. Cerberus pairs up really well with the Isis with that ghastly breath, magical penetration, but also Capri good at defending the Isis. You have Circle Protection, you have Scarab's Blasting, Rivals, Trapped would then be too resilient to handle. Yeah, the Capri ban, I really think is so good. We know PBM likes Capri, and he also goes to upgrade his Sunder on Capri, or the Blink, as he's done in the past, too, making so much work okay, with the Capri yeah. in the early game. And as you mentioned, being able to save the Isis as well. SK Gaming, I, I, I don't know how you make them more confident with a game reset after that, but the on her and the hell, this is SK Gaming going, all right, guys, we're going to beat you up. 
But also, we keep talking about how Sam and Paul are two of the star players, although all of them are star players in SK Gaming, and it really feels like they are terrified of them right now. A lot of direct bans for Sam here. How are they going to respond? I think they're just going to be very aggressive in their respective lanes and have the pressure. The ice is against the on her matchup. I am predicting that it could go into Arkel's hands, but with the Xingwei locked in as well, I'm actually predicting Panicat to play the Isis in middle, so it would probably be a very passive matchup in the long way. Expect aggression in middle. Yeah. Rival come out with a really strong draft here, in my opinion. So much CC, so much early game. I think it's going to be rough. Four as well can wall off the hell, right? She's definitely going to struggle with that, so I feel like his hell needs to get off to a good start, but if, she, if he doesn't, it's going to be rough for SK here, I think. Watching Hell in the early game for SK is fun. She does a lot of damage, and not everybody plays her aggressively. You know the old school style of like Breastplate of Valor? Paul doesn't do that. Paul goes all the way up and solos you at level two. But Paul doesn't die, so why are we going to see him die here? Well, he did pick up the Breastplate of Valor on the Merlin, so maybe this time around he will go a little bit more defensive. I like Rival's draft this time a little bit more than their last draft. Seeing how it's an Erlong Shen and an Isis has way more control than their Persephone and Sir Ket. So that could be good in terms of protecting the Xingwei if she gets in trouble. But SK, I gotta love their draft if they can get to the team fighting stages. The Hanbats, the Hell, and then you got the Executes to follow it up. I'm just worried about SK here because if this Hell pick does not work out this game, it kind of breaks your whole draft, I feel like. What is Paul gonna play the next game then? So I feel like for SK, this Hell pick have to go big. I'm confident in it. I think the hell has come out for Paul almost every single time he's, he's brought it out. It, it is a staple ban against this team. Well, looking at these two team comps now for game number one, Anatoly, what is your prediction? I like Rivals Draft more, but I'm going with my heart. I'm going with SK Gaming still. F dot. I like Rivals Draft here better than the one that they had last time. I think the Isis is a really, really nice assistance. But at the same time, SK Gaming, I trust in Hunbats, and I trust in the Hell. Like Zero said, if the Hell doesn't work out, it's kind of going to crumble. But I trust it. I say SK Gaming. I don't know. I, I, I just feel like Rival takes this draft, honestly, to me. And as I said, if this Hell doesn't win this game, it's going to be so hard for SK for the rest of this set. But this rival drop, Panda has an absolute beast on Isis as well. All right, everyone, it is time to get into game number one. It is Rival versus SK Gaming. Thanks so much, Kelly, and the analyst on the desk. Yes, here we go with game number one. And this moment, Ryan, it really comes down to composure. In unfortunate circumstances, but it happens to both teams. The remake happens, the picks and bands are remade, and we get adjustments from both sides. This is what crowns a champion, the ability to handle every aspect of the game, including things that are unfortunately out of your control. I think the big player I'm watching is Paul. He clearly upset that the Merlin gets banned. Obviously, yep. the, the Persephone situation. Understandable. Warps, picks, and bans incredibly. Paul cannot tilt during this game. And I agree with what Zero says on the desk. Worst case scenario is that Paul is ineffective on this hell. That is, a, that's the threat. The aura around the hell is that you have to ban it. If you, if you get into it and you actually don't, that's a scary situation. With a hell though, there's always that monster heal that's gonna come into play. I love the fact that they've also got that Circa and the Achilles. So it really limits some of what, well, hell's counters are. Executes to get through the re-sustain of healing. And of course, the anti-heal from what a Sir Cat will bring with that last breath. I think that SK has the tools in this draft for sure, but I'm looking at Mike on this Amaterasu. This was a signature pick for him in his career. I love the fact that he's pulled it out now. I don't know that he played it at all after the big buff. A little bit tricky to deal with Bel Air though, because an Achilles at this level will do pretty decent damage with those basics, as well as that Warrior Tabby in tow. Sorry, Warrior's Blessing in tow. There's now Panda Cat in the mid lane on the Isis. All kill will be pilot in the Jing Wei. Classic Hunter v Hunter duo lane as Twig will secure his own red buff there. Sam actually tried to blink in and steal it away and didn't get it. Now he's in a little bit of trouble. Sam just trying to get back towards Paul, who's still only level one. But obviously, because it's a hell, he will also have a heal and some damage, whichever stance he's in. But look at what that costs SK Gaming. Now Twig's able to just chase Sam out. He's got red buff. He out trades you. So he's going to just walk you down, head towards red buff. You don't have the wave clear to be able to contest that. Captain Twig goes two for two on red buffs early on in the game. Meanwhile, look at Neil Mara, that speed buff, dropping it down and stripping it away alongside the blue already. 
Neil's done good work for SK in this early game. He piloted that circuit yesterday with a vengeance. I, I love Neil on this circuit. It's exactly the type of style that I think he excels most at. The ability to make plays. The dude's a playmaker and is really willing to sacrifice his own farm to be one character that can deal with it. Here we go. First bit of pressure on Paul. And now we'll get the beads out very early. But round the back comes Neil Martin and pat his beads and out. And Paul threads the needle. Where's Merlin now, eh? Doesn't matter anymore. First blood SK. Listen, man, I'm not going to say a whole lot, but I don't think Merlin gets that kill necessarily. SK Gaming get off to the first blood, and it's centered around this circuit from Neil Ma. He's able to create so much confusion by his start on the right-hand side. Everyone's assuming he's starting speed, but instead he goes to blue, steals that away from final K, sets him behind, then goes to speed, but make sure that timer's offset is on a different timer, and then comes mid and sets up Paul for first blood. So a bit more of an advantage then for Paul in the mid lane as he now has those shoes of focus online already. A little bit of extra mana helps him to re-sustain up with the health that he's going to bring. But not only that, the mobility could come into play. He's going to need it right here. Pin, but not enough. Oh, that's not very good. Oh, where's your beads? Where's your life? Sam Vistaka does that to back. And I'm a bit surprised by that monkey toss and the aggression there, but he knew the abilities were down. Good idea, though, by Rival. They want to keep pressure on Paul all game long. Hell is that ticking time bomb that feels nearly impossible to deal with once she gets a little bit too much farm. Clearly, Rival is cognizant of that. Here comes Neil Martin on the left-hand side, though, waiting patiently to invade this buff and does a pretty damn good job of doing so. Buff is dropped down. I get the babies, but that's it. No, I think he got it because Panacat's not picking it up. He stole that red buff. Yep. Man, Neil's riding hot right now. I don't know. That's not even a coin flip in his favor. That's that's a weighted coin that somehow didn't end up working out. Rival up in the rotation, trying to catch all kill, but that little bit of agility helps him out of position. But now the purple is being invaded. That man alongside Neil Ma, PBM and all kill, gonna try and contest. Damage on Zap will push him back. And the frenzy pop there as well, funny enough by Polar Bear Mike, just to push them away a bit further. Just wants to make sure because Zap's level five and Arkill isn't. So that's a fight that SK really was okay taking if Rival wanted to commit to it. But after Zap is level five, feels like that isn't a great opportunity for Rival anymore. SK is on the advantage, so Mike kind of throws off the warning sign like, yo, you don't want to go in here. So now it's back to a normal dual lane for a second or two. Both supports hanging out here with their hunters just to soak up some farm. Relatively equal level as well, although I say that, Zap now hits level five. He's got that big Desert Fury ultimate. And Arkill, he gets safety when he hits five. Not a whole lot of kill potential. Zap man's got kill potential right now and just has that big first opportunity. I like the idea of Zap taking this on her away from Arkill. Don't forget, Zap's had a great season, and, and one of his best highlight reels was against Dignitas and against Ataraxia, where he started picking this on her when Nate was going for that Artemis that was giving a lot of teams trouble. And Zap Man put him in the dirt with an incredible performance on this on her. I'm excited to see what he brings. Now, on her as well, very good in the early game in terms of once he hits that level five, he gets a bit of a nice spike from the Desert Fury, but his control in the jungle run is very potent. Sure, he might not be able to get 1v1 kills against Jing Wei, which is relatively safe. Well, these rotations in the jungle, if he can get some pressure in this lane, could help out. I mean, he can get solo kills. One of the few gods that, that has that opportunity because it has burst CC and damage to follow up. You, if you can chase out the beads from our kill, then you have to make him play really, really far back. Has to start using the airstrike defensively. That means Sam for Soccer could come on over. I think there's kill potential there. And the cat got pressured enough by Neil there to force the circle of protection. Did hold on to his beads, and the crowd are happy about that one, realizing that's a big win. And Neil Ma only being level four, Panda Cat just doesn't have that information when he's getting full comboed by the Circuit. The Isis ultimate is critical against that Circuit ult, and really vice versa. Obviously, Neil Ma wants to use Last Breath to shut down the healing from Circle of Protection. But remember, Isis ult has damage mitigation, and that's something that's one of the only things that works against true damage. On the other side, Panacat will still get value from it, even if he might not get the deal. Funny enough, the red buff did go down for Rival there, but Pandacat being forced out of the mid lane and having to stay here means they don't actually make use of that red buff. They get the experience, but no extra bit of power for that Isis in the mid lane, which they would have liked to have it there. Oh, look at this execution play, but Captain Twig just a little bit too slippery. That man may have sprung that trap just a second too early. I think to Neil kiss a little bit earlier there, but as soon as you hear that Desert Fury, there's a little bit of a roar to telegraph that, and it just gave enough of a window for Captain Swig to slip the noose. Good idea by Fine. Okay, you saw him realize, I don't really want this smoke, man. I'm going to back it up. His ultimate is down, his teleport is down, so it's going to take him a little bit longer to get back to lane. 
Belair's hit his big power spike in the Glad Shield. Thor doesn't really utilize it as well. Fine usually goes for just boots in the breastplate of Valor. Tries to make his rotations count less so than his laning phase. Belair can start to force him out right now. I've already seen it once. Yeah, and also in the mid lane as well, that experience lead is starting to grow a little bit more there. Pulls two levels above Panda Cat already. And this hell we talk about a lies on the clock as once again Twig gets aggressive. The old CC chain is dead. Polar Bear Mike grabs him. Time for Sokka with a fear. No, Weevil didn't really catch the target he was after there. Rival just managed to slip around that left hand side. And a lovely pick on Neomar early. Sam was definitely looking for Captain Twig. No beads, no ultimate. Got no opportunities to really get out of that situation. Now Mike's gonna be a little bit careful there against Sam and Paul. He'll be looking for a bit of a revenge, but that's a big pick. Answered Neil Mar just to slow down the pace of this game a little bit. Because we saw Neil yesterday, he was really setting the pace on these Circuit supports. And Circuit can really struggle in this ISIS matchup. Just so much interrupt Ooh. for a COD that really needs her mobility. Yeah, that could be under pressure, but then I looked at Polar Bear Mike's help, Mana Bar, and was like, okay, maybe not so much. And the ultimate was already consumed in the mid lane. So it's a success for SK as they do invade that blue. Two level lead for Paul right now in that mid lane. And Neil gets the entire back heartbeat camp from the back camp bandit himself, Captain Twig. This is a good start for SK. I think that they're probably pretty happy with how these first seven minutes have gone. Wow, look how calm Panda Cat was there. Sir Cat's literally looking at him going, are you enjoying those creeps? Are you having a good time? Yeah, okay. No panic there, no beads, no, no reposition. He just farmed the wave and backed up. Good communication from Twig. That's what that tells me. He knows that there, there isn't any buttons up. Talk about communication. Here comes a very quick call period from Rival. And I don't think SK know anything about it. Great pick. I tell you one thing about a live crowd, though. They'll know now, not only the in-game sound. That puts the lead back a little bit closer to parity. Rival now able to even it up, but XP still in SK's favor, specifically around Paul in that mid lane. Neil has done this all weekend long. He's really given up a lot of farm. He's been behind his lane opposition pretty much every matchup, but Paul's been able to get ahead. Oh, well, Belair under a bit of pressure here. Got Paul about Mike coming round, but Sam is waiting patiently to make sure his junk, sorry, solo lane can get away from danger if that rotation came through. That felt like a pincer on the rotation more than the kill gank on the final K. Sam probably saw Belair starting to proxy, stepping up, decided he's probably gonna get rotated on. I don't have a whole lot to do in my jungle right now. Speed buff was just coming up. XP harpies are down. Let's make sure that, I, that we can get Belair out of danger because even though he has this big power spike in the Glad Shield, still no movement speed there, still no boots, and Final K still has that movement speed advantage on his side. As you see, like, the teleport's just coming out from both the solo laners as the Warriors having finally finished for Belair there. So there's a bit of a window of advantage again for Belair now that that breastplate's not online. Perfect timing for him, too, because this is right as blue buff spawning. He's gonna be very, very strong. And Sammy's on also here, the Fear No Evil drop down. Buff is down, and can he get to this guy in time? Just about, it was a little bit too close for comfort. He will get back to the safety of his tier two, but he's gonna lose a bit of farm there as well. He lost blue buff, he just teleported back into lane. He actually doesn't go breastplate, but contagion instead, an early investment into that anti-heal. It's good in lane against Bel Air, who's gonna be able to stand up with the glad shield and Achilles second ability, but also, of course, this looming hell. Back in mid lane, coming out from Neil Ma, but no panic from Panda again, so it's a light, it beats that. To make sure he got away. Oh, that Mikey, a ton of damage. And he's going to walk away. My Paul is swinging for the fences. And Neil goes, you know what? I'll have some of that. Forces Mike to use the ult defensively. Yeah, uh, this is why Hell gets banned an awful lot against Paul. His damn. I, I have never once gotten hit by a Hell and been like, oh, that did less damage than I thought. It is always so much more than what you're ready for. Especially with the Doom Mob as well. One of the items that we've seen a bit of a revamp this year. Had a couple of investments into it, and a lot more mid lanes are now rushing for this item. And the big thing for this item, for Hell in particular, is that big MP5 number. The movement speed is great on her, the power is obviously phenomenal, but she needs that extra MP5 in order to be viable. Think of all the metas where Hell is playable. It's because Breastplate of Valor is considered worth picking up. It's because Book of Thoth is worth playing. That she has a lot of boxes that need checked. And Doomor being the meta build right now opens the door for Hell being played. Sam keeping a lot of pressure on his right hand side, invading these harpies continually. Obviously the Fury being down at the moment, they're really pressuring the right to try and make sure Final K doesn't get any help against Bel Air here. 
that's huge because Belair is going to make these rotations and really be able to make a factor. But he needs to do it a little bit more slowly than Final Cake, who's got that semi-global semi ultimate. Captain Twig's going to be here for this blue buff spawn, first one in a while. Belair going into the jungle as well, but now he'll realize Twig was about. But Twig did blink away, and into the sky goes Final Cake. Okay, looking at Belair, and Belair walled off. But the extra minutes this David Paul will allow him to get the ult away. Neoma in trouble, but gets the last breath off, but it's not under the right target. Oh, Parker, no. gets them. Oh, no. a knockup. FG's involved, boys. Oh, it messed up for something as well. Lisbon can't find OK, get away. Panic has Spearable to fall down. Final K drops the wall, gets to the hammer, and he's back to the safety of his tier one. Oh boy, was that close. Belair doesn't want to let it go, but can't really afford to dive a tier two Ooh. this early. That's very ball, but then they get the heal from Paul, but in comes Arkill, trying to make something happen. The tap from Final K is good, and Arkill's rotation pays off a rival. That man's arrived as well, but maybe too late. Arkill gets his back interrupted by Paul. That man going for it over the wall, placed the ward just to try. But everyone a little bit healthier than he was ready for. So tied up a four to four there. Gold. Round 300, 400 in favor of SK at this moment in time. Is there anyone who's favored with how this has gone so far? I mean, Arkill gets a big rotation and actually gets a kill and causes that man to lose an awful lot more farm than what he lost. He's able to just back the base and fly right into the fight. That's why Jing is one of the big reasons why Jing Wei has been picked so much during placements and here at the World Championships. And Zapman has to just lug his way there, to walk the whole way over there. But I still feel like SK is, is keeping their momentum high. Even with that being said, though, I mean, Rival's right there in gold and XP. It's just a slight XP advantage right now for SK. Yeah, 2,000 to be exact at the moment. Split across a couple of members, not just one person. So we'll see how that ends up playing off. As now we see Polar Bear Mike on this left-hand side coming to check out and ward up this left part of the map. You can see the Fury is about to spawn. So this is the right time to start trying to get aggressive. You want to start poking out Zap. He has gone for the Devourer's Gauntlet, the slower, more traditional build. Arkill wanted to make it work right away with that Blood Forge. Oh my goodness, just start to hit away at the tower. No rotation coming from the support. So this is a nice free tier one tower for Ryber on the left-hand side. This puts Zap under pressure, this Fury too. Zap just couldn't clear the wave and, and maybe use the Impales a little bit more aggressively. Didn't use them to focus the minions. And that's good game sense by PBM, realizing they have a massive wave. And we've got Amaora. Let's just walk in there and use that extra damage. Not only that, Jing Wei can now rotate freely with a passive. She can get back to that lane when Zap pushes up too far. Great situation for Rival as Neil in mid. Checks in with Captain Twig, but here comes an Oni Fury attempt. This is right within vision of SK. Can Neil get him in time? He can, but I don't know if he can contest Rival secure it. And then Neil goes in and gets the ult off, but the back away is good from Rival. Zap trying to rotate around the other side of the red buff. Smart. Put off the option of escape. And Rival recognized that fall back to the safety of the tier two in left. Really good pathing by Panicat because Sam was hunting him with a potential blink ultimate. Actually looks like he may have blinked just to get in range of a potential fight. Now it's currently chanting for Rival as SK trying to get across oh. to mid of fine okay. Did ult across to try and catch Sam for soccer. But you saw that little circle on the ground just telegraph where he was going to be from that ultimate. And a quick jump away with the somersault. That's actually crazy, because Sam doesn't have beads, so if he gets hit by that, he is in a lot of trouble. Probably not dead, because Final K is pretty tanky right now. A lot of these Thors like to go a little bit more Bruiser, a later on Glad Shield, a, a Black Thorn Hammer. That has not been the case so far for Final K. He's pure defense. Bellow on this right side now has to be a little bit careful of Polar Bear Mike turning up. I don't think Mike's going for a kill here. This might be a Nova Tower, to be honest with how this is being played. And Belair might struggle clearing this Oni wave. I mean, Achilles is very good at boxing in lane, but his wave cleared a little bit risky at times. You have to be using combat dodge kind of aggressively. I like the idea, let's pressure him, knowing that he might have trouble clearing these Oni waves, but without a whole lot of offensive ward vision here for Rival, they don't feel like they can push up. Agreed, and I also think they didn't know where Sam was on the map more than anything else, as well as the only Fury minion wave dying. Better safe than sorry. However, the Pyromancer could be a little bit of a look here for Rival. Hey, that is an SK ward in the ground. It's an SK symbol too, by the way, so it's very easy to tell. Around the back comes Neil. Paul trying to steal two. SK! They get the Pyromancer, and now Twig needs some help. Good fear, no evil, but the wall blocks the execute. Belair stuffed. Fine, okay with that wall that really prevented the execute coming through, and the chase potential was on. Good work from Rival, but, but good work from SK, to be fair. They did steal that Pyro, and now they're in mid lane. Response time has been excellent. During that time, they, the Tier 1 tower falls in mid because of the rotation over by Rival. Look at this investment by Pandacat. Taking a page out of Paul's book. Both 
with that breastplate of Valor. Stop using the ult just to kill the red as Neil will slip away from that spirit ball just in time. Back towards mid lane and Paul. But now Paul, who is waiting in the back line, gets aggressive on the right hand side of the while though. Fino K dies to a gank from Sam and Bel Air. Wow, that's bad too because Fino K had ultimate, probably was trying to charge it up, but neither Bel Air nor Sam had ults available. They used them on that Pyromancer fight. This crowd is even, by the way, because every time one of them does something, they're all popping up. They're all right. They're, they got the side split too. One side cheers for SK, the other side is all rival fans. They found their seats nicely. Check out it on purpose more than anything else. What was that? Do you reckon they've done that more than anything on purpose? Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I got tweets being like, hey, where's SK sitting? I don't know. Here's a little look back at exactly what happened to Final K moments ago as Belair comes in, thanks to the Iron Apple instant replay. And that wall did slow him down, but yep. just not enough time to escape. Back to the action now. And Paul of Mike and Panda pushing down mid, but look at this pincer. Sam waiting for the ult, it doesn't happen. They're gonna spring the trap anyway. He's down for Panda, and there's a circle of protection. There's the ult mount from Neil Mar pushing Panda into no man's land. I tell you whose land it really is. That was their case. Now Paul has that two level lead once again. You can feel the momentum in his favor. Now Zap on this left hand side, forced to beads. Still has an Aegis if he needs it. Pillar comes into play. Desert Fury to try and put both damage back out. And Neil's doing good work on our kill. Oh, and Zap gets the kill. Doesn't get away with the airstrike. But what can Zap do now? Zap man, pounding rival in the jungle. That's popping off right there for Zap. And now fine, okay, trying to slow down the aggression in mid lane from Bel Air. But three members grouped of SK on the left hand side. That should be a tier one tower. Maybe even a look towards a tier two. Do you reckon they can do that? Absolutely. I mean, they've got Bel Air rotating in. The one thing to worry about is that both Paul and Neil are pretty far away right now. So all SK chance right now is this tier two should crumble. Sam Pasaka will take down the red buff on the left hand side at the same time. And you can just see how the action, since that kill on fine OK on that right hand side, has just escalated SK to a comfortable lead. And look, Arkill was rotating early and often in this game. He flies in at level 12 or something to defend blue buff. He's rotating over to Pyromancer. And Zap, staying at home, pushing that left-hand side, pushing mid lane with that half rotation. And that level of farm ends up being really, really critical. He was level 18 in that fight. Captain Twig, level 12, level 13. Even with getting the purification beats, he's at such a big disadvantage. And Zap Man, First time in the final here at the world stage. Of course, the, the launch tournament's one thing, but this is a whole different beast. It's gonna be a new copy pasta somewhere now. Right? Uh, absolutely. My man looking as comfortable as ever. It wouldn't be that man if he's not standing his ground in the 2v1. Now this hell from Paul is doing good work in the mid lane. I'm, I do want to talk about Paul a little bit. As, wait a second, wait a second. Zap's just chilling, doing a gold fury. Meanwhile, the whole arrival on this right hand side trying to get some pressure there. Man, this really is shades of season one. Zap man making plays, soloing gold furies. That's what you used to do back in the day. He's gone away a little bit, but not when you're level 19 at 19 minutes. He's got all the farm in the world. Now, rival a bit unfortunate with the state of affairs and what happened in left. They get a tier one, there's nothing really much more for them to take in the jungle. I think, if anything, they got a blue buff they find okay on the right hand side. But now Rival is starting to group, if you know, it's a five-man unit. Why is this? They need to defend against SK because they've got so much potential to just tank these objectives. They don't have that traditional objective burn. They don't have the, the merlin Chronos combo or anything like that that's going to take down these objectives really, really quickly. But they've got sustain with Paul, and so they can stand to sit on this fire giant for long enough. And SK's on a bunch of power spike items right now. Void Shield just finished. For Bel Air, a Divine Ruin. He's got a full item and a half over Panacat right now in the mid lane, as well as a four level lead. This is the time for SK to group. I could have been far forward here, and a great monkey toss from Sam will follow him and chase him down. Remember, this is level 13 versus 17, and I think Mike's in a whole world of trouble. But there's a fury from Zapman comes through, and that's that some Sam for a nice pick. Why is Mike that deep? No reason. No reason at all. Maybe trying to get a little bit of information, try and steal some farm away, but it's definitely not the right area. Sam uses his ultimate because he's got plenty of CDR, 20% between the Transcendence and the Hydra's Lament, and he can afford to just use that ultimate to keep Mike down. Well, meanwhile, fine, okay. Just trying to proxy some waves to the best of his ability, but I don't know where he can really come down here safely. The yeah. pings you see were in the base, and fine, okay. We'll get away with this. Cheeky, cheeky. 
But at the same time, at least SK punish him for it. They take a Pyromancer. And now they might pull Fire Giant. Now Fine has teleport, so he's right back to the fight, but no ultimate's huge. Blink after blink, and Twig uses Till to get away. Fine OK's wall prevents the chase on, but there's a chase on Arkel in mid now. He has to wear strike away. Neil's still chasing on and catches him in the gust and throws him back towards his teammate. But Polar Bear likes to help him out. Sapa Soccer will have the other hand smash as now Mike is in trouble. Bel Air can't find the execute, but he's got the spear anyways. Two for one for SK Gaming. And off to the right hand side go SK Gaming. Four members strong. Only Neil Mar dead here. Fine, okay. Doesn't have an ultimate just yet. Captain Twig on the way back. How long is this going to take? It's going to take them a little bit, but maybe not. Death is swinging right now. It really is. It's already down to almost half out. Fine, okay. Hit by the fear. No evil. Does have beads up and does get away from danger. Sam chasing the somersault as Paul comes around to check where Twig is. Chase on for fine, okay. Remember, no ultimate for a few more seconds. Yeah, but, but he's got up in time. He's got a lot of CDR already with the build. I think that this is SK realizing that maybe we can't go for Fire Giant right now. I disagree. I think they could have gone right back towards that fire as soon as you force out both Final K and Captain Twig. But not having that that knowledge of the Thor oh, cooldown may have been enough to send them back. Well, the next thing to really talk about is the Ox that are now on the table for both teams and they're both upgraded as well. They both have sustained in these kits, but this item can really change a fight very quickly. 100%. This is a, just a sick item that a lot of teams are going to be picking up this weekend. Well, I guess we're already in the finals. I keep saying this yeah. weekend. We're nearly already done with it. But look at Rival. I mean, they get crushed by it. PBM, Panda Cat, Captain Twig, all going to be on the receiving end of that extra little bit. Ike forced to use his ult after being chased through the jungle again. Mike doing a good job of trying to ward up these important areas of the map. By SK are just catching people unaware. And that is a huge tool that Mike really needs, that dazzling offensive to force the relics or the cleanse coming from Paul. That's the big problem now is that you've got to check a lot of boxes before you get a chance to kill Paul. Now Fire Giant started up, but it was a bit of a bait tactic. Catches and Twig in the turtle fork. That means no healing for you. Oh, oh man, of evil! And the damage from Paul in tow comes through. Two members of Riangle are already dead. Make that three as Panda Cat falls down to Bel Air. And now it's SK yet again, looking for a potential fire giant once more. And look at what Sam's doing. He's just, his whole job, know exactly where Fine OK is at all times. Make sure he doesn't have an angle to Thor dunk us and maybe try and take the 1v1. I'm OK with this 1v1 because he's keeping Fine OK busy. And Fine OK now going to take to the sky. He might look for the 1v1 himself. Looking for Sam, but Sam spacing it perfectly. Fine OK does get the red buff, but Sam for soccer might be looking for more now that he has fire. Exactly, because the regen will come into play. And they bit of damage too. So I'm going to eye up the prize here. Is now Bel Air rotates in with a blink. What a wall from Fine OK prevents that. Bel Air's not done though. He's going to keep it going. Paul looking at Captain Twig because Bel Air and Sam, they've got Fine OK under wraps. Meanwhile, where's that man? He's taking a tier two tower alongside Neil Mar. They're onto a Phoenix line, forcing rivals to defend there. Now Paul and Sam are pushing up mid. We're looking at more tier twos. SK are looking good here. And six, zero, and eight for Sam for soccer on this hunt bat. And his fight selection has been excellent. Everywhere that he's been, SK is really motivated around him. But I really feel like this whole game turns that play up by Zatman around the purple buff. That's the that's the big momentum builder. SK was they were winning, they were doing things well around the map, but Z but Zatman showing up and being like, yeah, we're here to play. We're here to win this World Finals. Felt like really put a whole lot of extra energy into SK. When we talk about the mentality of the two teams coming into this game, especially the issues at the beginning, and the fact that everyone was talking about Paul on this hell, going, hey, they ban away his Merlin, Persephone's taken out. Yep. And everyone thinks, man, this is mean for SK. Well, look at him now. This is exactly what was needed. Yeah, I was, I was on the pessimistic end at the beginning, just as Zeros was, where this hell better do well, or else their picks and bans are in trouble for the entire set. This is exactly what you were hoping for, with, with this type of performance. But it's also that not only is, Sam, is Paul doing very well with the signature pick that you feel like you need to take away, yeah. but Neil Ma has had a great game on this circuit, continually harassing. I mean, th his scoreline, 1, 3, and 10, doesn't even come close to telling the whole story of how I'm much he's had. I'm surprised he got it again because of the way he performed on it yesterday. I'm really shocked the rival let him get hold of that. 
And really, realistically, Mike in the early game couldn't really get anything going. Paul's poke in that early game on the hell really limited his options of engagements. Exactly. This Amaterasu is there to consistently force out options. And speaking about forcing, Fido K forced to use his ultimate and his beads. Sam just hunting. And now he'll force him back to base without that ultimate. Makes it a bit trickier here for rival to defend. Sam pressuring mid though with the minion wave. Belair keeping Twig in check on the right. And it's gonna force a 3v, well, see how many situation on this left hand side. SK has been sieging so differently than every other team. They love trying to do the, the 3 0 2 split or this 3 1 1. And it puts teams in a weird spot. You're, you're not used to defending against this, you're used to the 4 1. But how do you handle Bel Air and Sam in the 3 0 2? Bel Air starting to switch towards the mid lane, gonna head back towards the right. As now it's Neil and Paul and Zap all together. The real trio that's very important. Neil took a ton of damage, but we will still see Paul there to resustain. Bel Air, meanwhile, has combined with Sam for soccer, uh -oh. but he can't find the ultimate. And Twig blinks away for the Phoenix. Different story. That's huge. They at least get Twig to survive. But look at this. SK still wants left. And they're going to continue to dash in. Mike gets a kill. Our kill picks up Neil Ma. And Paul has to limp away towards the mid lane. It's not great for SK, but the damage has already been done with that Phoenix falling on the right-hand side. Yeah, but that's the worst Phoenix to get, Graham. It's the one that's easiest to defend Fire Giant with, because you could easily push up the Fire Wave and be local to the Fire Giant at the exact same time. SK Gaming with a massive lead at this point. Their lead was, what, 13k before that siege started? That's not really good enough to just get one Phoenix. At this moment in time, it's about 27 minutes in the game. Experience is still kind of important, because not everybody is level 20. These last level 20 levels that are needed for a couple of members of Rival will give you a bit more health, a bit more damage, just more everything, really. And Rival needs it desperately. They need a, they need gold for itemization. Last time we checked in with Panda Cat versus Paul in the build department, Paul had Divine Ruin, Panda Cat had Spear 1. Since that, Panda Cat has bought one extra tier of his next item. He's gotten to a Chanted Spear. Paul has finished the build since then. So this gold disparity has grown very, very rapidly for SK. Rival needed this time to get their XP and gold in order. Does that mean well has the Titans Bane finished now? Look at the two Haunters in question here. You can see how far behind the state of the game is. Titans Bane and now a Jotun's wrapping that first item slot over the Hunter's Blessing. Whereas our kill, whole three items still to pick up at the moment. It, it does feel a little bit odd to see the Jotun's Wrath, but Zap's just looking for as much cooldown as he can get. But why not fail not if that's what yeah. he wants? Fail not still 20% CDR. It's attack speed, no pen, no. power. The lack of flat pen, it must be the difference maker for that man in this moment. But he's already got so much flat pen built in with the passive. I mean, maybe sitting with a little bit of mana as well will come into place and can cast another, you know, pillar, another impale. There's nothing worse than being an unhurt out of mana. We can spam a little bit more, and Mike is under so much pressure here. Walks into the jungle. That the shield is just about, but the detonation damage is good. And so in the back with a fear no evil. That's a double kill now for Bel Air. And Bel Air is not even close to done. Chasing out our kill. It's a triple for Ronnie. But can he get a quarter? No, stop says not right now. Maybe later. It's more important to look for the victory and take game one. The rest of Rhyme, sorry, rest of SK are piling down right hand side. Find OK being delayed back. You know what? They're going to do this. SK are going to. Stop rival who have been on an undefeated streak so far. Are you kidding me? Rival has not even come close to losing a game this weekend. SK did not look, let that one look close at all. No, a dominant game one by SK. I completely agree. I look at what happened in that game and never really felt like SK were out of it, but I never really felt like rival were in it too much. They answered back, they got a couple of things going in the early game. But once SK started to pick up the momentum, the drive from yesterday has just continued them onto into these finals. And that's what that comp is designed to do. It's Achilles in that early game pressure, consistent blue buff invades onto Fido K. It's Paul getting all this farm in the mid lane. Neil sets himself behind intentionally. Paul starts making plays. But Zapman's big play in that mid game really blew the game wide open. Sam was consistent from minute one to minute 29 or whenever they ended that game at being at the right place at the right time. This aura about SK, man, this momentum they have, Rival's got to find a way to break it. I mean, when we saw Paul play, overall, he's died very little. Gets a hell pick, sits in the back line, his position is always good. 
a help doing that, resustaining your team can make a big difference. And then, especially when you've got Neil and Belair doing the frontline work that those two are doing. Think about that last fight. Belair gets a near quadra kill, and Neil Ma starts it all off with a perfect initiation on the mic. That's game one. We could have another four to bring you. We'll find out after this break. Welcome back to the Alienware Lounge there, where we just finished up game number one of Rival versus SK Gaming, and I must say it was a hell of a game. It was definitely quite a script by Hindu Man. Oof. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, SK Gaming, listen, all I say is that when hell comes out for Paul, he gets the first blood at level two. What happened here, he got the first blood at level two. I'm just saying. It's such an important game for SK to win, especially with his help. I mentioned the game earlier, if the Hell didn't look good this game, that would have been kind of rough for SK going forward in the set, but now with the Hell doing so much work in this game, it's going to look really good for SK. There were some signs of life from Rival with the early aggression from both Captain Swig and also PBM that Sir Kent Erlangshan made a lot of work. They had a very early one-for-one -one trade after giving up that first blood, but it wasn't really enough around the team fights. I think Sam for Soccer had an MVP performance on this Hunbats, really dissecting a lot of team fights. Without a doubt, 7-0 and o coming out of that Hunbats from Sam there, but but, I mean, who do you give it to here? Who was who the key player on SK Gaming? Sam and Paul. I, I don't know. I, you can't forget about uh, Belair on the Achilles and Nailma on this circuit. I don't know if you can give anyone MVP in this game, honestly. Sapman on the honor. <laughs> I mean, about that? Th that's what's fun about this team is that I, I've talked a lot about them being middle of the pack when two players are doing well, but there's a ton of them doing it. Like, even Zatman made a lot of aggressive and confident plays. One time when he was jumping away in the duo lane and then coming back in, instantly immuning himself from the CC to use the Desert Fury and then calling his troops to action here. Almost getting a triple kill in this play. The mechanics from Zatman was just top tier in this game. Yeah, let's actually talk a little bit about from that early to mid game that we saw. It was a little bit of an even game, I think, around the 10 minute mark. It was four and four, very early aggression. What was the turning point for for SK Gaming because they just ran away with it. I think honestly it came down to one Sam for Soccer really threw out some ultimates there around that 16 minute flank even from the solo lane he found a couple of picks onto final K or even forcing out some of his defensive ultimates when Zap popped off around that 17 and a half minute mark. That's what kind of enabled SK Gaming to start getting some objectives for themselves. I think it was also really hard for them to lock down this hell. It's like you have an Amaterasu support it doesn't bring that much CC right. He has her out for the stun but that's super easy for the hell to cleanse. So uh, I just feel like this hell kind of gets to do whatever she wants. And she's so strong in the early mid game if you don't shut her down. And that, that's what I was talking about. You know, you asked me the one player and I said Sam and Paul kind of, because when Sam and Paul step up together, it's, it's incredible. I mean, Zeros, you played a game against them earlier on in the season where they both stood up and did this sort of performance. It feels like you just, there's too many players on the field. I don't, I don't know if they performed like this when they were... I'm pretty sure I beat them every time, so... But they're on a different level right now, though. I guess nobody can mess with the Zeros. Got it. I want to talk about the support matchup there, though, with PBM versus Neil. PBM, actually, with how rough it was towards the mid to late game there, was 
holding it together. Yeah, he was level 19 while also Nilma was struggling to be level 17, but a lot of that came down to sharing the waves a lot. Every time that Panikai was struggling in the mid lane, it was PBM picking up the pieces, so he was getting a lot of solo lane farm anyway, so I wouldn't really take into account for PBM like out farming Nilma in the individual talent matchup. I think it was just more of picking up the pieces. Well, we're going to be jumping into picks and bands of game number two, everyone. SK Gaming with 1-0 over Rival. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the uh, PBM and Nilma, and I have to say it about Nilma. We see him a lot. He's at one level behind, maybe two levels behind, but I think he's the most unselfish support in the whole league. If he ever needs to be anywhere to defend a buff or help his teammates out, he will go there every time before getting, like, trying to farm instead. I've mentioned it time and time again, he just has the right instincts. You know, what a support should do, that's where his brain immediately goes, and I mean, you know, I, that's who the guy is. He's a selfless guy on the field, off the field. I think if you know Neil, you understand his play style, and that allows SK Gaming to work around him and have players like Sam Paul, Zatman, Belair do what they do. Zeros, so what are your thoughts here, Rival taking second pick? I think that's kind of weird, because I feel like on first pick is way easier, then you can go back to ban. What I thought Rival would do is ban the uh, Morrigan, Uller, uh, Hell, and then pick Merlin for themselves in the first pick, but they can't do that now in the second pick, so kind of curious why they choose second pick here. Honestly, I don't think that the Isis really worked out for them in that first game, and they would rather deal with the Isis themselves than to deal with the Hell. I think that there's going to be a strategy employed here at Arrival. I'm trying to think what it could be. I know Captain Swing has played Odin in yes, the past if SK were to lock in the Isis, but I think Belair had great success on the Achilles in the solo lane last game. Yeah, Achilles actually, I feel like, has been a pivotal god during this entire Smite World Championship series. F-Dot, what do you think of this Thor pick for Rival? I think the Thor pick is, is one, one of the ways to go. Sam is going to have it if you don't take it with the Achilles on the side of the layer, so. And sort of same thing with what how PBM was kind of holding his own in that game. I feel like Fine OK on the Thor was doing pretty well as well. Exactly, and so when you look at a game like last game where SK are kind of snowballing, killing it, what little bit did it for us and make sure we get it back? I, d I honestly didn't even like that four solo too much. I think he got really bullied by Achilles in lane, I feel like. If this, I, I hope this four goes to Captain Twiggy benefit. I think taking it away from Sam is the bottom line. The, the, in lane, it did get bullied. Team fights was different. Rather see it go to Twig. We know Fino has the circuit solo. There's a lot of things that can go on with this rival draft. All right, Merlin and Poseidon finishing out the first phase of picks for SK Gaming versus Rival. I'm sure uh, Paul's very happy with that Merlin since his hell was banned. I just want to touch on Poseidon. I, I really don't love Poseidon in general, but Panda Cat's Poseidon has been very, very impressive, as has Twigs. And so when we look at this Rival draft, I don't know where any of these characters are going, and that's a good thing for Rival. Yeah, for Rival, the Poseidon could be Django, so they could look for a double, double Hunter composition here. But then again, I think PBM has had the strongest Poseidon all of this year, so wouldn't surprise me for him playing it. But then you have to worry with the Poseidon. They have a lot of setup for the Kraken and one-shotting people, but Capri kind of counters that, so I'm not 100% sure about the Poseidon. So you say that it's going to counter out the Poseidon, but I think, if anything, it's the Poseidon that counters out the Capri in the, in the sense that you're going to cripple the Abduct. It's really easy to focus out the Capri and really blow him up, force an early kind of Scarab's blessing, or maybe wait for that target to revive and then blow the Kraken after the fact. Big ban there from Rival in the Hun Bats. That is directly, looking at Sam, that was way too good. Yeah, you're not getting to play that again. What are your thoughts, though, of Poseidon being overpicked of Isis, which we saw them play last game? When it comes down to it, like I said, it's, it's a flex pick for the team, and Panic Cat has played it well. Twig has been out of his mind. Zeros, your thoughts on the ice, lack of Isis? Just didn't look that good last game, but then again, Panda Cat is sick on Isis. He was against the Hell last game. I like the Hell got off to a really good start. Really hard, to, no matter what you play, it's really hard to play against Hell. Especially as Isis, she's kind of short range. You kind of have to get close to confirm your damage. And if you get close to a Hell, you get pretty much one shot. So, but he wouldn't have to deal with the Hell this game. So I wouldn't have mind him going back to the Isis. Looks like we are seeing that Susano that was hovered over in the last game. And Hachiman still not locked in just yet. The Zapalo coming back. Z -z 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 man. That's a throwback and a half. I mean, he's playing the on her. He's playing the Apollo. We're back in the season zero days. He's making the plays, man. He's going to call his jungler lasses. That's what's going to happen here in this game. 
All right, what do you guys thought on this neat pick to finish out Rivals Comp? I really like it. I think this is what Rival does best. Double physical hunter, a magical jungle for Twig, and then just early pressure from everyone else. I think this is what, how Rival wants to draft and how they should draft to have their most success. I really agree there. I think the Neath is going to lock players down to allow Captain Twig to blow him up with the Kraken. Panda Cat's going to look good on a basic tutorial character, and the rest of Rival will fall into place. I like Rival's draft, but it needs a lot of coordination to make work. And I think that SK Gaming, riding off of the momentum from game one, especially with Zaman on Apollo, is taking game number two. Looking at these two team comps, Zeros, what lane matchup should we be focusing on? Where is all of the action going to be happening? <laughs> that is kind of hard to say, but <laughs> I, like it's just Satman against Orkil again, like the Apollo versus Jing. Like, it's gonna be so, like, them too, you never know, both super aggressive. I'm kind of sad to see Orkut play the Jing, though, like, the passive hunter. I would want to see, like, an aggro versus aggro matchup. Yeah, the, the, I have a feeling Zatman's gonna be dashing in a lot. I would have liked to see the ROM roll in a lot from Arkel. This is, I mean, this is a fight. It's gonna be all about the long lane. It's gonna be really hard to dash in when you have to worry about the global pressure. A World Weaver can easily fly in that direction. You gotta worry about the Anvil of Dawn, depending where that Thor is coming from as well. Which is why I love the rival draft. I think that SK Gaming after game number one are going to play aggressive. It's shown that playing aggressive against a rival only team is going to be positive. And so rival has picked a bunch of characters that punish over aggression. This is really well thought out by the purple team. So then FDOT, what is your prediction for game number two? I mean, realistically, this comes down to uh, if Rival play the X's and O's well, I think they have the composition. But SK, if they capture the momentum that they grabbed in game number one, there's something intangible about playing your own character. Zatman on the Apollo, I think, truly is transcendent. I'm not just having fun here. Okay. After game one, man, I can't not say run SK. Anatoly, real quick. SK Gaming. Zeros? SK as well. Looks like our analysts have it 3-0 in SK. Everyone, it's game number two. I don't know about all that. I mean, 2-0 SK in the finals against Rival. I just, and honestly, I think it's really going to come down to who you see on your screen right now in Captain Twig, because this Poseidon pick and these Whirlpools that cripple so much could shut down a hell of a lot of what SK can do. I mean, SK clearly had a lot of respect for the magical jungles that Twig has been playing. They banned both Habwa and Athena in that first phase, and Rival find the other magical jungler that's left that Twig usually plays in that Poseidon. I like the draft from Rival, but it is early game dependent, man. They need to get off to a good start in this game. Not necessarily the pre-five minute start, but if we're sitting at 20 minutes, we're sitting at 25 minutes, and we're even, or it's an SK lead, I think this set, this composition from Rival could really, really struggle. I took a little bit of other compositions as well. Neil Moss starting the game off with Boots 1 and just four health potions. Shows me he's not going to be going through necessarily too much aggression early game. However, as we watch Polar Bear Mike blinking on this Sir Ket here, you can see that he's just got that Guardian's Blessing and more potions. He wants to try and disrupt the jungle, and Neil's gonna be here to try and slow him down. Notice as well, Neil's got beads. I mean, Mike should be just fine here. He still has Ambush. He's not too worried, or excuse me, the Deathbane. He's not worried about it. The, the Relic selection for Neil, no Sunder, no Horrific Emblem, means there's no way Mike dies. But Sam again. We'll go with the early speed and just go straight to the red buff. The most important thing here is that Mike has kept Neil pretty busy and kept Belair busy. He's gonna make Belair lose a couple creeps on that right hand side and start his own blue buff. Talk about most importantly, Captain Twig though got left alone at his speed buff, got his harpies, and now over to the blue. Yep. And the Poseidon going in the early game is important. Mages in the jungle can work, but they get pressured in the early game to really hinder them. And that's why this pick looks so good, especially against the Kepri for Neil Ma. Yeah. Kepri can do that invade nonsense, but it's just such a big target. It's a short range dash, even if he decides to go for abduct. It's not an easy invade option. And so I think that this really does work out nicely. Rival taking that circuit away from Neil Ma. He does so much work in that early game of game number one to just strip away the entire enemy jungle. That was huge for, for so Comes through from Neil, and that'll be a nice bit of burn, Sinjin damage for Polar Bear Mike there from Paul, who was at that level two moment in time. As now Sam will rotate towards his blue buff on the right. Things are square for the time being, PBM, and Neil both still at level one. 
It's an interesting start by Belair. So he starts blue, but only takes the big Harpy, and that does a couple things. It leaves a little bit of farm for Sam to come and get later on, and gets Belair to lane a little bit faster, but also staggers the blue buff spawn so that it might be easier for SK to get an invade going later. Sam being very patient here. He's hoping fine will use those abilities. There's a couple Barrage down. No hammer used at the moment, but look at Belair's health bar. Getting lower and lower. He's trying to bait himself, but he's taking more poke than he bargained for. And now he's going to be a potential reset. But fine, okay, stepping up again. Sam still hanging out. This is working out very well from Rival's point of view because Sam is not doing anything there. Exactly. No, no farm at all. I don't even know if he was close enough to soak from that position. He's going to leave that whole wave to Bel Air anyways. Meanwhile, Captain Twig doesn't have a whole lot of jungle up. And Sam did have a little bit of a lead at that point. So he's okay taking that risk. He's okay taking a couple seconds to see if Fido K is going to make a mistake in the laning phase. Meanwhile, Neil and Polar Bear might will stay in mid. We've seen a lot of this just lately. Very reminiscent of previous seasons where support stick to the mid laners. It's because all the farm is in the middle area of the map, right? So you want to make sure they're secure and you're sharing that experience. It's the most contested farm on the map. There's the, the It's the most easily to rotate over and, and see if you can find it. Speaking of finding, Rival might find themselves a kill here on Bel Air. And here's a blink from Mike, kiss for Bel Air. Can't jump away from a Whirlpool. And first block for Polar Bear Mike. And that's what I was worried about with these Poseidon picks. The Whirlpool on the ground cripples so much of what SK will use for mobility and escape. They've got plenty of it too. I mean, every god on SK gets affected by this cripple. It's gonna be a problem potentially. Is Sam gonna try and win this buff contest? He does just that. And now Arkill just has to be careful and walk back to lane. He'll gonna walk over here, pick that one up too. But Sam's done what he's wanted to there, just trying to limit some of Arkill's farm. He's still level five, as the route from Neil was just off the mark. If that would have connected, it would have been a bit of a different story there. Could have, but Arkill's got ultimate and bees at that point. I think it's pretty hard to lock him down. Look at this roving gank squad by PBM and Twigs through the jungle. This is exactly what they did to Bel Air earlier. And in goes Polar Bear Mike. Will Weaver coming through from across the map from Panda Cat. Neil Maw there to try and block it and does a good job. And that's why he's got the bead so he can do just that. Zap to the sky though. No Turn around, play. Twice his world. And that Zap saying, let's play, boys. It's game time. And he's looking for more too. The 3v2 Zap Man. Mike ends up escaping as Paul rotates in. End of the day is an interesting endeavor for who comes out on top. Two for two, only one kill goes Zap's way. I feel like that's pretty much a wash. I mean, PBM gets another kill and escape, so I'm gonna give it to Rival, just based on getting Mike some more momentum and some more farm. He's gonna be able to affect the map really, really well on this circuit, just as we saw Neil do in game number one. And I think that's gonna be the big thing for Neil here is, what he was really doing in that phase more than anything else. He wasn't level five. As we watch a gank in the mid lane towards Sam for soccer, into the cracker from Captain Twig. And Neil Mark can't escape the tornado as the poison took his life away. And now Zap and of course Paul are here to try and defend. But the damage is done and Rival is starting to establish a good lead. 3-0 and now for PBM. He's going to be close to level six off this wave. And Neil Ma still only level four. The blink option for Sam for soccer, what you want to be able to go on that Susano, but when there's guaranteed CC coming from the circuit, feel like that's a little bit risky. Ooh, Zap catching that dash has really put Arkill under pressure there. Without his beads being available, he did air strike away, and I think it was rightly so, because Sammy's on the warpath now. Remember those beads down. He stepped on two wards here, so Arkill should know this is going on. And still has blink too, but no typhoon for him, but good call by Arkill to give this up. No beads, no ult for him no reason to stick around and try and die for a purple buff. I love that SK staying aggressive, but this is exactly what Rival needed to do with this composition. They're using the meat salt aggressively. PBM is setting the pace wherever he goes. I like this. I like this call for the gold fury. The shred from a Merlin and the damage of an Apollo at this moment is the best window to get SK back into the game. Rival had a lead. It's just been nullified by SK Gaming. Just a little bit of bad back timing by Rival. PBM, Captain Twig, Arkill, all coming out of bay and Panacat all coming out of base at the same time. That's just too much space you're giving away. And now Paul rotates back towards mid, has to deal with Captain Twig. Twig wants to take a check on this, as in the jungle, Mike. Wow, he got him. 1v1 in Zappa Soccer, and I'll take that sort of celebration if I was you, Mike. That is huge. I mean, you gotta get him in back in the game mentally, and that's perfect timing. Speed's coming up. This is gonna be stripped away. No way Neil steals this one. 
This is big for the mentality of Rival. I've said it all weekend. Where, where Mike goes, Rival goes. And this is exactly what they needed. This has to be the final game of the tournament that I see Sir Ket in the support role. Agreed. This needs taken away completely. But that means you are leaving something else up. It's really gonna be interesting in the next picks and ban phase, but first of all, we've got to get through this one. There's still Mike contesting, Neil on the rotation though, and Mike forced to ambush away. Neil won't give chase any longer, and now Polar Bear Mike gonna go back in because Panda Cat and Ocula here because the red buff has just spawned. Look at the XP advantage for Rival in this engagement. They're gonna give it up because that man has a good angle to rotate in, but actually, no, he doesn't. He looks like he ulted already and is really low on mana. I'm surprised that Rival doesn't go for it. I just assumed with them backing up that they were worried about Zap, but I don't think they really needed to be. It's only a 1,200 gold lead for Rival because of that gold period a little bit earlier on. Same for the experience as well as that juggles back and forth. We're still all tied up, so it's still anyone's game. You say the longer this one goes, the stronger Rival becomes, you feel? Or is it the other no, way? No, I think it's SK. I think SK's team fight later on is far, far better. The Merlin is going to outscale the Neath pretty consistently. Both Apollo and Jing Wei very good in the late game, but I would give that nod to the Jing Wei. But the Susano going to do more than the Poseidon later on in the game. I think that SK, if they can weather the storm, are going to be in a good spot. And now Polar Bear might continue the aggression. Sam got aggressed on earlier on, and with Neil and Paul falling back, he just pushed Mike back for a second or two. Polar Bear Mike involved in all six kills so far. 4-0 on two. He's got four of them. You would like some of those kills to have gone elsewhere just for a little bit of an experience and gold advantage right? Normally, I'd agree. But it's a Sir Ket. But it's Sir Ket and it's Mike. And I think I want him getting every single kill that he can at this point. Belair could be getting trapped here as Captain Twig was waiting around the corner to see if Belair would turn up to try and defend. This blue buff is now being invaded. Fine, okay. We'll secure it and get an advantage on the right on this Thor again. You surprised to see the Thor for the second game? No, not at all. I still think Thor is a premium pick in, the, in this meta, especially against the team. Oh, nice pull from Sam and a bad pull from Neil. And Mike will do great work to survive and set up a crack in the twig. Oh. It comes by no day to clean up the pieces as Belair goes out to back with Twig. It's all two for two. It supports dead and the junglers. Yeah, uh, Thor's still worth picking, by the way, even with a little bit of a rough game one. Final K sees that fight happening seconds before it ever ends up kicking off and right there to follow up. That was beautifully done by Rival. But SK, keep in mind, they just shut down PBM. That's big. Sam for soccer still gets only an assist, but gets a little bit of momentum rolling. I feel like I'm okay with that trade if I'm SK. Now they're a bit frustrated with how this has gone so far, starting to whittle down Fine OK. As Fine OK still doesn't have either the Contagion, which I don't expect of much of this game, it'll more than likely be the breastplate online just yet. Whereas Belair, with that Gladiator Shield, should be very, very aggressive. And he's doing just that, but maybe a bit off more than he can chew now. Isolated with a rotation coming through from Twig, but not only Twig, Mike's on the hunt, and with a quick kiss, Belair will ult away in time. The chase could still be on, however. Sam lurking in the jungle, but only level seven. Doesn't have Typhoon back up at this point. Good call to back it up and not go for that aggressive play. He just needs to take time and farm. And Rival's done such a good job, Mike in particular, of being at his farm on time. Even his back left harpy is the one that's the hardest to get. I will say, Agro, if you can actually see that happen again from Belair when he plays that far up and he draws that many people over, if the Gold Fury spawns or any Fury, the Primal's the next one. That's a real option for SK again to look for that, especially with the Merlin and the Apollo, as we mentioned earlier. Absolutely, we saw him burn it once already, but Rival knowing they've got a window right now where that Primal Fury isn't going to be up for a little bit, are grouping S5 in the mid lane, looking to keep Bel Air behind and continually steal away this blue. And it is successful. Give that to Polar Bear Mike as well. So a bit more cooldown, middle of mana regeneration. However, Zap's done good work in this lane. Takes down a tier one tower. Sure, our kill did work, get one earlier on, however. So that's all even in the duo lane. Thing is, that's gonna release both hunters now from this lane in phase. It will, and Zap it has the advantage. He's got a big light lead in stack so far. He's almost double what Arco has in the Devourer's Gauntlet stack, so he's awfully strong right now. I wouldn't be surprised to see him start to rotate. Primal Fury has spawned at the moment, though. Rival do have the Oracles, as well as a ward down for the division if they need it. You can start to see the circling from both teams around that left-hand side, as these two solo laners 
Danny was talking to me about how she feels like Song Lin's had a real impact in this tournament. Ooh. We don't really spoke about it too much, but it really does when it gets to the team fights. I mean, Bel Air has been huge for SK during their run, and Final K has been equally big for rivals. What's that doing? Hello, Zap? Thinking about it. Man, this is what happens when you give an almost infinite mana to that ultimate, you know? He's gonna have Zap circling around forever, looking to find a fight. I mean, he loses a good amount of that mana, but he's able to strip away the red buff in the process. That's certainly worth his ultimate. Especially when all the fights are probably gonna be local right now, to his side of the map. Fury's gonna be the big contest point. Double tap out and find okay there. Did hit level 12 now. So those secondary relics will come into play. And that's a huge spike. I'm gonna talk about secondary relics. Look how far behind Sanford Soccer is at this moment in uh -oh. time. This final K is gonna go for this. Doesn't find the dunk. He was looking to read that Vision. ultimate, but Bel Belair is done underneath that tower. Nethal, just too much to handle. Love the call from Final K. He could have gone for the ult, but if he goes behind, he gives vision to Pandaka for the free kill and covers the option of escape too. Exactly. Belair holds on to the ultimate, probably the right call, but th this consistent blue buff invade clearly felt in that kill. His ability to just not have enough levels or the golden XP to be competitive in that lane, a two-level deficit for him. Primal Fury started up by Rival, going down relatively quick. In comes Zap and Neil Ma. No steal this time round. Rival get the Primal Fury. The mess from Zapman will at least slow down a bit of aggression. Didn't use his beads there, Rival, after that kiss from Mike. He didn't know he had Neil right behind him if he was required. I mean, the, the XP deficit right now for SK is just really, really hurting them. Captain Twig is way ahead of Sam for soccer. Final K well ahead of Bel Air. But look at the job that Zapman has done his farming. He's actually up 300 gold on Arkill, even with that last Fury going Rival's way. So if I'm Rival, or if I'm SK, all my fights should be around Zapman. Whenever he has ultimate, we're down to fight. Twig forced the beads away there from that abduct from Neil Marn. A good play from Neil yet again to get the relics out of the jungler. Still only level 11, so Captain Twig doesn't have his secondary relic online. What would you like to see him go for? Would it be an Aegis, like a normal mage? It would be, because Sam is just gonna destroy you if you don't have it. He, in the late game, even though he's down right now, he's gonna hit late game Susano at some point if the game goes long enough. So you need itemization, and in this case, a relic option to keep yourself safe against that insane late game potential of the assassin. Good news for the SK fans though, Paul does have that Spear of the Magus online. And that Shred is gonna come to play a little bit more. So useful on Merlin to get a bit more damage out, as well as the flat pang that you get from this item too will help him out a little bit on wave clear, but also poking the team fights. If people are staying in position, this is what Neil thinks of the fight. Neil is the guy that you have to be worried about on rival, pretty much at all times. Not only his ability to initiate, but of course, his ability to negate a lot of what's going on. from Mike, avoids Neil Ma, and the abduct with the zigzag. Paul can't avoid it though, beats down, Aegis down, forced the ult from Neil Ma. Paul will still live oh. until Final K arrives, and now Final K will take his life. The Kraken from Twig hits two, and still comes in there with the pressure from Bel Air on the backside to slow him down. But look at our kill! He's gonna find one, not quite the second, but Bel Air has done a good job of keeping everyone else from rival busy. Little bit of rough relic usage there from Paul. You have to go in and make sure that they kill you as fast as possible to get that reset. Uh, I don't know if he's supposed to be using Beans and Aegis in that spot. Rival, of course, is going to play around that Kepri ultimate, but just a bit of a miss of Duck by Neo in a rough situation. Ooh, he's not going to get aggressive. He saw the Whirlpool used by Twig, but Twig's pretty Momo with a speed buff too. All the while, Rival doing the Pyromancer, and Twig going to take the boxing match against Zapman. These two are both looking for world titles right now. And Zapman is going to win the 1v1. Big play there from the SK game. Man, Zap is here to play, man. He has made it to semifinals before and has always fallen just a little bit short of making it to the finals. A mainstay of the SPL in his first finals appearance, certainly not wasting it. He blows, oh, blows game one wide open with his on her play and right there steps up. Paul has no relics here. He's gonna get pulled back in towards Arkill and Panda Cat. Mike gets away though, and that's so important, but so does. No, I don't up. think so. I don't think so. Final K's here. And will he be able to find the hammer? And he will. Just to tip his arm and speed and jumps to the hammer. Back towards his teammate who needs help in mid. Or does he? Pandika, keeping him in tower range. Belair forced to ult away. The double tap doesn't connect all the way. But Arkel finds the kill. This is looking good for Rival. This is exactly what this comp needed to do. Get PBM ahead. 
check my man killing everybody in the early game. Then use his lead to bait SK Gaming into your damage dealers. Check. Now they've got a secure fire. Okay, Sam is the only one nearby for SK Gaming, but he's zoned away by Polar Dynamite once again. Equal level between the jungler and support player there on that right-hand side. Zap gonna split push to high heaven. Very useful on Apollo at least to get some gold back and maybe threaten a Phoenix. But when they've got a Jing Wei, it kind of limits that option. This is the best win condition now for SK. He's playing through Zap Man, but even with his big lead, Arkill's passed him in net worth because of all the global gold that Rival's been able to get. Rival still has a double hunter composition. It's going to make it very easy for them to get towers. There's a lot of gold still on the map in those towers at this point. 4,500 between all three tier twos. Now they've already gotten one. But you add an extra 3k to this lead for Rival, they're at 10k. Love the idea of Captain Twig here as well. Jaden for scramble. When is second? It's that man in the sky yet again. No. You're going to be a little bit worried that he might think about trying to make a play. And those poor old harpies, what did they ever do to you? Zap uh, definitely showing that it is not season one Zap man going in in the 1v4 in that instance. Still has that extra little bit of game sense these days. The ultimate being down does hurt, but his potential to split push is really, really limited right now. Because SK just desperately needs his damage. Look at that timing out of Rival, though. The moment that Fury is spawning, they're there and on the scene. On E-Fury 2, this will really help to put pressure on multiple lanes as Mike gets pressure onto Sam again. He's ulted and under pressure as the hammer comes out. Fine, okay, gets back up from Bel Air though, as a good stun comes through. Look at the execute, but he's avoided. Fine, okay, still find Sam for soccer. They need to kill Mike right here, and I don't know if they will. Oh, Neil, well, he'll be there in time, but Paul might be in trouble now. Twig turns up one where Paul's taken by Paul, and now Bel Air juggled in the air by the tidal wave. A Kraken hits two. The ultimate from Neil will buy Bel Air a second, but all the while, this is happening. Where did the Phoenix go in the mid lane? Double Hunter comp, by the way. We got two of them. And we're going to take the mid tier two and the Phoenix on top of that. Zapman was pushing up the left side that whole time. Never came in to help defend. And with the middle Phoenix being down, rotation now from Panic and an all kill to the right one. Oni Fury Wave on the way. Twig doesn't have his cracking up, but it doesn't really need it here. Zap's trying to push back Panda with pure willpower. As Neil tries to make something happen without a duck, but he knew his life was going to fall down. Sam gets it and takes down Twig. Oh. All kills airstrike puts him in a dangerous spot. But Zap, he's on his last legs and he's going to fall back. You got to make sure that Panda Cat doesn't get his ult in time. That was a sick mesmerized by Zap Man. Of course, Arc you'll see C immune during death, but you get physical protections by hitting that serenade, and that little bit of physical prod saved his life. Great work then from Rivals to get two Phoenix, or one Phoenix already, and SK to defend. Is Zap gonna rotate back to the jungle? Gotta be careful of Fino okay, Kern this left hand side, actually. He's probably there, Mike saw that up too. They know exactly where he is, and a collapse could have happened. Fine, okay, we'll get a tier two tower, and Rival are in full control of game two. Man, I, I feel like Zap's just being a little bit too ambitious with these ultimates, right? And maybe the positioning. Yep. There's your analysis for this one. He will eventually fall down. No one in sight. The poison will tick away. I know the crowd got really hyped for that. I'm like, no, if he does it, that's a real cast of curse right there. Zap balls, seven to 18. The grouping of Rival is towards this left hand Phoenix. I don't know how SK managed to defend. Frenzy popped by Rival. They want it now. Right, okay, in the sky, looking for an option. We'll catch Sam Hello. after there. And Sam is not allowed to play Smite anymore, at least in game two. Paul will try and zone away Rival on the rotation towards mid, but this base is in tatters. And Rival, they can sense blood. They're going into in this game. It's only 20 minutes. I mean, they don't have a whole lot of itemization to help them, but I don't think it matters. They've got such a big lead. What a bounce back by Team Rival. They crushed SK in game two. And now we're starting to see the best of these two teams in just two games. SK game one, they wrapped up, their motivation was there. But this is the Rival squad that were the number one seed throughout pretty much most of this year. And now they're back on the board. We're tied up in the finals. It's exactly what I'm sure all the fans were hoping for. A close oh, set so far, one to one. But this is where that Susano pick, everyone always looks at the late game potential. It, it dominates, it kills everybody. Why doesn't this guy get picked every game? Well, that. Sometimes you just don't get a chance to play. This Sir Ket pick is going to be highly, 
highly contested from here on out. It's gotta be. It's won both their teams their first games. And if you think about how Merlin played that game, the Hellbound was really important to him too. Yeah. Limiting Paul in that mid game. This is a battle of the supports for me, but Agreed. at the same time as that, those solo laners, they're both making impacts, and the big ones too. They are, but it's really centered because one of their blue, one of their blue buffs is just getting stripped over and over again. Game one, final K, Belair pops off. Game two, it's Belair, final K dominates. Blue buff control is gonna be huge the rest of this set. We're two games down, this is a best of five, so it's all on the table for the next one. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back to the Alienware Lounge here. I am joined by Zeros F. Dot and Anatolian. Gentlemen, this is the set that we want to see in the grand finals. I mean, rival looking unstoppable there. Anatoly, I'm going to ask you who the key player was, but I feel like I know the answer. It's definitely fine, okay, without a shadow of a doubt. 7 0 oh, 6 to end that game, and ending in less than 21 minutes of play because of his global pressure, because of just the sheer damage, his opportunistic plays. It was so difficult for all of SK Gaming to really get away when they were in any sort of trouble. I have to give a shout out to Polar Bear Mike as well, doing so much on this circuit in the early game, and really, I feel like he's the main reason why Rival gets so far ahead in this game. I mean, we were six minutes in. Mike had four kills and a ton of assists at the same time. Honestly, he's playing jungle too. He's leading the team. Sure, we all see him after the game. He's leading the team by example in game, and that's really important. Can we talk about Arkel as well with that 1v3 dive under the tower and still gets a kill? Arkel has been the hunter's hunter. He, no mages, thank you. No weird position. He just plays Hunter, he dives, he gets aggressive, he left clicks, and he wins, and this is what happens when he performs. I love when he just holds the W key and makes the plays, and Rival was just holding the W key ever since that level three gank onto Belair, great communication, but then there was still a lot of good plays from SK Gaming, yet again, Zatman makes crucial season zero Zatman plays, a lot of confidence from here, even after landing from that chariot, he was able to continue this 1v1, does die ultimately, but this is the confidence, dashing into the opponent's side. Yeah, I feel like those two hunters, there's a two of alpha hunters in the league right now, like both of them, as you said, Arculeuri as well, 1v3 under the mid tower, so these guys are not afraid of going in. Really not at all, and, and I think that's a big part of it. Them kind of giving the front line or, or the front line of defense. And then you see the assassination from Fine OK. You started the conversation with him. We have to end the conversation with him as well. I mean, just such incredible pre I presence. I think the adaptations from SK Gaming need to be picking up this circuit. It was, as, it was Rival that actually let the Isis go through because they knew they were going to have the circuit, have the last breath for the anti-healing. SK Gaming never took that bait. They didn't ban away the Isis. They never drafted the Isis. But I think this is the point where you have to respect PBM's potential on this goddess. I mean, although Rival definitely had the advantages the entire game, SK didn't really fall too far until the very end there. They were able to grab a Gold Fury for free at the six minute mark. They seemed to be quite even in gold until around the 10 minute mark there. So what really, again, was the shift for Rival to have the advantage and take the win? I just feel like Rival, whenever Twig is in a magical jungler, if it's the Hebo or even the Poseidon, the Poseidon looks just as good in my opinion. Rival just plays in a different way when they have this double hunter, magical jungler, and they look unstoppable. We saw that against Dignitas yesterday, yesterday as well, the two first games. They did win the third game as well when Twig was playing on the Achilles, but not as firmly as the first two when he was on the Hebo. I think Twig did his job on the Poseidon. A name we haven't mentioned yet from Rival was Panic Hat underneath. His global pressure on the World Weavers was very crucial. A couple of them were going on the side of Belair, he couldn't really get out of danger. Then even applying pressure into the side lane, no one really was able to put Panicat in a cage in this game. 
The biggest thing here for me was everybody bought in, and that's what's important for Rival. They played their position, right? Captain Twig on the jungle beside could be front and center, but looking at the way Final's actually playing, let him kind of be the jungler, let it rip, take the game. I'm really excited to see what our picks and bans for game number three are gonna be, everyone, and we're gonna be jumping into those right now. I mean, what do you even focus ban here? Do you focus ban anyone? Do you get rid of the Sir Cat? Do you get rid of the Thor? Do you get rid of like everything? Sir Cat, you, you gotta get rid of the Sir Cat. The Thor, maybe pick it, maybe you get around it, but you gotta get rid of Sir Cat. I don't agree. I think Ebo Poseidon should be the ban for SK. Get, <laughs> you need to get rival off this magical jungler and the double hunter composition. They're probably gonna try to run it anyway, maybe with an Athena jungler or something other magical, but I think they used to so, they just play too well with it. I think that uh, SK is agreeing with you there. Habwa ban coming out. We might be seeing a Poseidon ban coming out as well, but it is Hell banning or on the side of Rival there, not wanting to see Paul pick that up again. It's all about the jungle comfort at the end of the day, and I think Sanford Soccer is very comfortable on all of his gods that he's been playing. But what if he got the Thor? What if he got the right attacker? Getting some more global pressure for himself. I think that's the direction SK Gaming should take. I think if SK bans Poseidon here, well, that's like a super high IQ play, in my opinion, because then you cannot take away all those gods that Twig has been playing really well on. I, with Rival banning Circuit themselves, I'm banning Poseidon here. I think Rival banning away the Circuit means that they want to first pick the Isis. They don't want to deal with the anti-healing from the Circuit's last breath. They want to make sure that Panic Eye would be a little bit safer in this game three. Ferks, picks coming out for Rival here. You what do you expect right Zero? Uh, oh. the, the Uldra, apparently. Uh, <laughs> but then again, I'm kind of surprised with SK banning the Athena over to Poseidon. Like, as you said, the Poseidon, not super impactful last game, but I just feel like Rival plays a all? completely different way whenever... I feel like they just feel more comfortable when they have them kind of draft. I, I think you kind of mentioned it before. There's these three picks, the Athena, the Poseidon, and the Hebo that kind of enable everything. The crowd very happy with the Thor pick here. Rival, though, Arkel is a is a he's an on or off player. When he's hot, he's almost unbeatable. That right there after game number two, he's hot. They just looked at him and said, What do you want to play, dude? Honestly, if I'm SK gaming and I see the Poseidon being drafted, I think I made a misplay by drafting the Susano, a guy that gets countered by the cripples. Instead, I would have loved to see a Robin potentially to fight into the Poseidon, make some very easy dive attempts, and knowing the play style from San for Soccer, he loves to dive anyway. But now that he has a Thor. I still wouldn't My love to see the Poseidon up against that matchup contained. either, though. Merlin being picked out for Rival here. Again, taking that away from Paul. It, that's really smart, I think. Like, what does Paul go to now? Because, like, the Hell is out the picture, the Ulr is out the picture, the Merlin's out the picture. We can't play Persephone anymore. So, Isis. those are the only gods we've seen him. I don't think he's going to play Isis. He might, but I don't know how good he'll be. We've seen Zatman pick that one up instead. So, yeah, why, why are we not seeing an Isis pick or ban here? I think the Xing Chen, the control is very important. Uller, no CC immunity. Merlin, no CC immunity. They're very susceptible to what Xing Chen wants to do. So I like the control pick here over the aggressive pick. Now, from Rival's point of view, it might be because it's not into their play style. Maybe they're just not used to playing Isis because of how often it gets banned during practice anyway. And for SK's point of view at this point, Dealing with an Osiris as an Isis, despite being a couple for, you know, eternity, I think Osiris wins that matchup dominantly between uh, mitigating a lot of that damage, absorbing a lot of it from that mitigation, and then the anti-healing from Lord of the Afterlife prevents Isis from doing anything. Still working on their second ban of the second ban phase here on the side of SK Gaming. It looks like... It's going to be a Horus ban, which makes a lot of sense. We did see them play a lot of Horus, but in the last two games, not picked or banned. Horus does a lot specifically against the Thor. Then you can lock him down, kind of make the hammer uh, a wasted cooldown almost. Achilles does a great job of chasing down individual players. Horus can keep Achilles at bay. Individual lockdown is what Horus brings, and so denying that is a good look. And there is the final ban, in fact, going in the way of Isis, but does SK really regret that, not picking her out? Probably not, but then again, a Thor and an Isis in the same team composition is rather strong. You can set up one or the other, and you have great long-range poke. But I think safety is going to be the theme of the game for SK Gaming now. Yeah, for sure. And this is probably Sapman on the hardship. Like, what mage will Paul 
pick here. I'm, I, I'm really not sure. See, I'm excited because I think it's going to be something really weird. Thoth. Thoth? I mean, other than that, you think it's going to be the Thoth? Well, long range setup with a Thor. Yeah, why not the Thoth? Well, let's talk a little bit about this Hachiman pick here because, again, I don't think we've actually seen Hachiman played the entire Smite World Championships. Super safe. I mean, uh, one of you guys said it here. The name of the game for SK Gaming is going to be safety here. But SK doesn't play safe. Exactly. And I think it's time for them to start playing safe. After last game, Apollo on Sandman, he was playing very aggressive. He made some highlight plays. The Jukes up against Captain Twig, which is phenomenal highlight, real potential. But it takes more than just individual plays and talent to win the championship. And this is what you guys were talking about. They're scrim partners. Clearly, there's a reason that they're banning out the Guan Yu. I think Rival's very happy that they got it through. Kepri into the execute. Is that an issue? We shall see who is the I don't know. I don't, I don't, personally, I don't like it. Maybe it's just to take it away from Nilma. But then again, Nilma lost game on the Capri. It didn't look too good, so kind of weird. But this Guan pick, though, obviously was banned before. So I just don't like Guan, though. I never liked Guan Jungle, but maybe you can prove me wrong here. Talk to me a little bit about this Raijin pick. We did see Zapman play Raijin, I believe, day one. Is it possible that this is going to Zap or to Paul? With Hachiman being selected, it's really hard to say. I think this is more of a Paul God. When he was playing in the minor league, when he just started the SPL as well, he was making a name for himself on the rise, and he would rush the Bancroft talent. He would do a lot of 1v1 plays looking for those kills. Yeah, this is a deep cut off of Paul's demo EP before the first album. You know, this is, this is what he used to play. Like I said, some weird... And we're already getting a contentious grand finals one and one for Rival and SK Gaming. Anatoly, what is your prediction for game number three? I'm still sticking with SK Gaming with all my heart, but looking at the draft here as well, I got to favor out SK still on top of it. Having the Thor for Sanford Soccer this time, we need to see a lot out of him, and he's been consistent this entire tournament. I think if I could do my game number two prediction again, I would probably go Rival. Like, as soon as I walk back there, I saw the draft a second time. Um, but the SK Gaming, I'm looking at, I'm looking at Sam. Sam with a Thor in his hand. It's, it's scary. And so I say SK. Yeah, Twig, Twig's not on a magical jungler this time around, so I have to give it to SK as well. All right. I haven't asked the audience for a grand final, so I'm going to ask them now, who gives it to SK Gaming? <laughs> who has rival taking it two and one? This is SK Gaming. Thank you so much once again, Kelly. Yes, game three is about to begin. And as always, when we get to this stage, the picks and bands get mighty interesting. I mean, this is what I was asking for yesterday by Renegades. Just take away all of Paul's gods that he's been playing, Hell, Uller, Merlin, and Persephone, and go, okay, what do you want now? Oh, then you give Sam that Thor that we saw how lethal he was with it yesterday. I feel like Sam's impossible to ban out, though. I mean, that's just been the, the guy. They've saved his pick to bottom two almost every game as of late. It's one of the first times we've seen him actually get prioritized early in the draft. I like the switch up by SK, and I can tell you from experience, Paul's Raijin is a classic for him. I played against it a whole lot back when he was playing console. He's very, very comfortable on this god, and it did get a buff fairly recently. I, I think it could work, but this Guan Yu might give it problems. You're up, you're CC immune to those Taiko drums. Guan doesn't care, man. He's just gonna be chopping you up. On well, the early game there, you saw Rival take a nice little wander through the left-hand side of the map to get a bit of vision, see if they can find a pick. And now, there's a bit of action on the right-hand side. His final K steps up, four members stronger, SK Gaming. Pull in their mic and watch on, and then he turns around and goes, sorry, fine, you're all on your own now. But it's only gonna be Belair and Neil Ma giving chase now. Sam and Paul will stay back to get the speed buff, and Fino Case potions have ticked away to put him back into a healthier spot. Plus, he's got that Warrior's Blessing proc. He's just got a, such a low cooldown on that first ability that he's able to stand here and box. Look at this, Thunder on the Neil. This is a man fight, and Neil's gonna be very careful, forced back to his tier one for a second. Now Sam on the rotation towards the blue buff. Junglers are off to a good start. Supporters have stayed with the solo laners. At the moment, it's all still pretty square. Look at Bel Air. He's just saying, nope, no one allowed past here. Playing bouncer on that blue buff. 
That's exactly what SK needs to get Bel Air in a lane where he can actually stand and contest. You just see Panda Cat there eating that Raiju damage from the Raijun. It's one of the reasons that he's back in the meta again. That Raiju did get a little bit of a buff in terms of its potency. And it's allowed him to clear just a little bit better. It really is a, a huge buff because Raijun's late game still feels really potent. It's still very easy to bounce someone with that Raiju. Hit him with a percussive storm and have it bounce through the whole team fight, and they take a whole lot of damage. It feels like his early game couldn't fight very effectively. And I think that's because, because of the storm situation, you're always looking at you kind of stood still, you're stuck in the animation, so you're very susceptible to return damage. With Raiju, it just releases a bit of that pressure, so you don't have to use the percussive storm sometimes. And Raiju is a great tank killer as well. He, he builds oh. proc items very well, so Soul Reaver, E Staff. Items like that synergize really, really well with him. Hey, right. what time in the game is it? Uh, it is two minutes. Where's Sam? Uh, he's in the dueling. Is that normal? Yeah, it sure is, at least for Sam for soccer. He, he loves this early gank, but our kill's on a god that fights very well, even being low level. But he's got to be very careful about his position. Look at the dance forward and back. Zap's been baiting him out well, but Zap ate a ton of damage on that combo. Now it's our kill's turn to turn away. Remember, no axe for a second or two here for him. So Sam's not going to waste any abilities. He was hoping to force the leap away, but Arkham was very diligent and patient now. Max, he's looking for a little bit more with PBM rotating in. Knows that he's got a little bit of support. PBM might be looking for Sam. With a hammer out from Sam, will say, no, I'm not interested in contesting. Even jumped to his hammer away. On the right-hand side, though, Neil Ma, as Paul about Mike is not left, is busy dealing with Captain Twig, trying to slow down the farm that Sam is technically losing from being over here. And this is perfect, because PBM's stopping Sam from backing. Blue buffs are coming up. This is going to either prevent an invade by SK or prevent a defense on the potential invade. Rival are going to just look at their own blue buff, not try and get onto Bel Air's. That's because Neil is over there, whereas Sam could be rotating it. And now this blue buff will go down. Favor of SK on the right hand side. Mimo Zap's in an awkward spot. He wants to farm in the lane, but he also wants to defend his purple buff. Uh, half health is going to be so, so careful. But I think his pressure alone has given an idea that Zap knows he's got backup coming. And Arca needs to double tap, forced to jump away. And Zap will get his own purple buff there. But this has delayed Sam's farm an awful lot. His speed buff has been up since he backed to base, as has these back harpies. So instead of going to all of that guaranteed farm, and it looks like he may have just actually gotten zoned from that red, Sam's gonna be pretty far behind Captain Twig. I wouldn't, yeah, Captain Twig, very top of the net worth charts right now. Sam near the bottom. Look at the gold deficit. I mean, nobody has died in this game. There's nearly enough a thousand gold in the lead for Rival here. But it's because Rival's pressure has kept SK bottled up on that left-hand side. And it goes back to this cooler pick by Arkill that gets him so much pressure, so much kill potential and this Thunder pickup from PBM. All that together kind of forced Sam for soccer over to make sure that Zapman's A-OK. -okay. But now though, Arco gonna head back towards the left to join Polar Bear Mike, who is soaking a bit more experienced than maybe Arco would like. But at the same time, I guess Arco's experience isn't too important with the fact that level five spike for an all it's a little bit different than a traditional god. He's already got access to his four button. He can already use it as switch dance. He doesn't really need that. He's just gonna be putting points in the one and three, skipping the two and the four up until he's able to complete both that bladed arrow and the hail of arrows. That's when the, the Uller power spike really hits its peak, it's right around that mid-game. Zap continues to pressure and rotate as well. Something we don't see out of Zapman all the time. He's one of the only haunters I've seen this year that's done a very good job of stalling the waves out, making people overextend and allow gank opportunities. It's not often we see lane freezing. We, we don't really see that too much in Smite. But Zap's been the master of it so far this year. I completely agree with you. He, he really has been trying to get these little edges. And that's what a player who's been around as long as Zap is going to learn how to do, is, is find those little windows where he can end, end up getting an advantage over his opponent. Quick going to help out with the Kill on the right-hand side and find OK as Bella going to clear with the creeps. Meanwhile, in the jungle, Polar Bear Mike and very aggressive on a Capri. Takes a while as a support in that situation to get any sort of farm whatsoever. But this is perfect. Rival again, Invade Blue, Sam level four, Mike level five. Sam's level of farm has not been there so far this game. And so it's pretty much impossible. Good pressure to rival. Arkill jumps into that fight. Don't think that was intended. And Sam goes, hello, hello, hello. What's going on here then? He drops the ultimate down, but Neil on the rotation. Sorry, Mike on the rotation. will get the ultimate off and delay any further aggression. A little bit of miscalculation from Arkill there. Yeah, I think he just missed it in that spot. I mean, it looks like a bad spot for him to be jumping. 
Probably wanted to turn and jump, maybe didn't get his mouse around fast enough. I don't know what happened, but it cost him his beads and Mike his all. It did look like he might be trying to leap over the wall too, which is funny enough if he would have done that. I think he was in a worse spot. Yes. Sam was just hovering around that corner. Exactly, which makes me realize that it must have been just a, a misclick on that three. Gets Sam a little bit of momentum. He's able to use that ultimate as soon as he as soon as he gets it. That's a good sign. Gets Sam a little bit more involved. And now there's a there's a lane that he can go to. There's kill potential in at least one lane. Seeing Captain Twig on this Guan Yu, though, does bring quite a few memories back. We always see him through the years of getting to the World Championships, pulling out some interesting pocket picks. Once upon a time, he even ran the Nike jungle, if you remember that, which was oh, Lamia yeah. boots. He's definitely an inventor and a creative in the jungle, and willing to play any role, but hold that thought, look at this fight. Slows our kill down. Neil Ma's gonna be looking for the ultimate, but just a little bit too much there from SK. Our kill's able to create enough space between himself and Neil Ma to not be under any threat. I would have liked to see Zap play that a little bit more patiently, just yeah. wait until Sam can come over and ult him again. That's a guaranteed kill. And I like the idea of the pressure right in theory from SK because no beads on our kill right now. Obviously, no CC immune ultimate for an all. Great situation to try and get that pressure. Just pulling the trigger a little bit early. He did that as well in the on her game, if you remember. Yeah, that's right. A little bit, a little bit amped up in that moment. But the idea is sound. You want to wait out that jump. Make sure you get as close as you can with the Hachiman. Our kill is a little bit too quick. Bit of a tactical battle going on then in the early game. No kill so far as Belair is potentially losing his blue buff once again. There's three members of Rival here this time to contest it. Paul and Neil in mid looking to try and clear out and pressure the red buff. Sam's going to the sky. He's going to look to steal it away from Twig with a dash, secures it, and gets him out of range. Oh, the cavalry charges there, and Twig's looking for an escape route, or is he? He might go back in because backup's on the way. Good ult from Paul and there, Mike at the right time. We'll at least get him away. And Panic X leans up Paul. The overaggression from SK is punished. Sure, the red buff went down. Or did it? Because it's Paul and there, Mike that has it. Well, he, he, look, his save, his, his buff. That's the way it goes around here. Just a little bit too hesitant by Sam. Maybe he's not ready for Captain Twig to be leveling the dash, but he's waiting and waiting and waiting. And Twig has no Bs. You need to be CC chaining him immediately. Plus, you want to get the buff. You, you know, you want to get that extra little bit of gold and XP. A little bit of a misplay, waits too long, ends up missing the dunk because of it. But credit to where it's due to rival there. Captain Twig, he had his ultimate open. Instead of running away, which you expect, he knew the call was coming through that his team was on the rotation. Could he buy enough time? Yes. And as well as that panda cut in that fight, he really did help out Twig a ton. Huge. A lot of damage over that wall. Is able to catch Paul very, very nicely. Looks like he may have actually gotten the beat at the same time. So those are on cooldown now for Paul. And that interaction that I was worried about for Paul's end. Up into the Tycho drums. Feel like you're going to be doing damage. Juan Yu is going to do more than you in that moment. We talk about because of Storm and how limited your mobility is locked in the animation. Same for the Tycho drums. Those drums have what swing. But you are a sitting duck, and against the Merlin with blizzards and fire sprays all over the ground, it's not an easy task. Sam back over to this right hand side, looking for Fine. Okay, they've got him in execute range, but Fine still has ult. And meanwhile, here comes a rotation from Twig. Remember, there's some sustain in there if it's needed, and the shred is good enough to kill him. Oh, and Fine, okay, Rupert and Belair. The up down in that situation was good, and Captain Twig gets himself a double kill. Fine, okay, looking like the master in the movies, where he's just toying with his opposition in the 2v1. His patience, his ability to stay cool under pressure. This is his first world. Don't forget, this is the biggest game of, of Final K's life. And he's able to stay calm, cool, and collected. Hey, hang on. He was on the desk last year for us, right? That's, but did he do finals? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think like, so. That's the furthest he's been, then you're right. Great play from Final K. That went twig with the rotation. I know that's one of the things about the executes. I love what Tom was saying, actually, funny enough, on the analyst desk about Achilles against the Kepri isn't necessarily the greatest thing for a Kepri, but I do like the Guan Yu because the Guan Yu resist thing can come into play. Didn't need it in that situation, but certainly can be a big factor later on in the game. This, again, early pressure onto the blue buffs has really cost SK Gaming a big portion of a game. It's because Sam is so far behind. Imagine if Sam's able to get a little bit more itemization before that gank. Yeah. Final K has to use his ultimate way earlier because he might just die. I also think they're trying to nullify a lot while Belair can bring, but here we go. SK going to start the Gold Fury. Good position. And they've caught now Rival unaware of this Gold Fury a couple of times. I am very surprised that SK are getting objectives that easy. I mean, 
Captain Twig even can't catch up with a blink already expended if he tried to catch it up. Rival definitely needs to be a little more cognizant of their back timers, and that's really credit to Zap. Quake's still getting aggressive on Zap, though. Zap still has his ultimate and holding it for the stun. But the amount of damage that Guan Yu just did there was huge. Sam was up and down, and now Twig's a little bit overextended. Twig gonna go in for the dive. He's got an ultimate. He gets the kill. And bye bye, friends. But what's this? Oh. Neil Ma! Neil Ma to the rescue! And Paul turns up with the percussive storm. But Arco was right there and waiting for Neil Ma at the same time. It's gonna be a two for one for Rival's favor. Twig and Mike working so That's well really together. Cool. That's exactly when Rival looks like they're the most dangerous. Can you imagine being Zap there like, are you kidding me? How am I? He's gonna live and I'm gonna die to this? Great play from Twig, great play from Mike, and now it's gonna develop into a tier one tower. In that situation, Zap and Sam just have to all in Twig to try and kill him before he gets the kill on the Zap man. There's no waiting out that ultimate. He's surviving no matter what you do. You want to try and make sure you can bail Zap out in that spot. Should Zap have maybe ulted earlier there? It looked like he was trying to hold the ultimate. I guess it, it felt to me like he was unaware or unafraid of the amount of damage of Guan Yu would do with the ultimate, but we know how much it can do. Yeah, I think so. I think you want to use that ultimate a little bit earlier, but knowing you have Sam right next to you, you kind of want to bait Twig into that spot in between your towers. Just well played by Rival. And the cat rotating to this right-hand side here. Gank attempts onto Belair. Mike's on the way too. And Belair is in a lot of trouble here, surrounded by four members of Rival. And as soon as he dies, this is an FG call from Rival. Here comes Sam, here comes Paul. They know what's up. And Rival immediately resets to the Pyromancer. They know that Sam is up. They got that information with Final Case scouting. Might be enough to still look for Twig. He was hoping to be path towards Neil. Twig a little bit too wide. I'll kill Neil now. Does at least see a double tap that leaps over the wall. Paul with a percussive storm over the wall. As well as Raiju will do a little bit of damage. Not a ton, however. Not got that Divine Ruin online just yet either on this Raiju. And that will really help out some of this sustain. I mean, he needs Divine and Spear at the same time. He just needs to be doing more damage to these tanks. And there's three of them for Rival. Mike is going to be super techy. Fine, okay, it's going to be hard to kill. And Captain Twig will be the same just by way of those warrior base stats. This is a tough composition for SK to really chew through. Hachiman can start to get that damage going later on in the game, but his ultimate loses a lot of value by playing against less squishies. I feel like Rival's draft is just better. And Rival there, get a Pyromancer uncontested from SK. I think with Sam's all being down, a lot of them just realized it'll take a long time to get a Fire Giant for them. But we'll accept the loss of a Pyromancer at this stage, having known they got that Fury earlier on. You should, I mean, we should have all known that as soon as all three analysts pick SK for the third game in a row, they're cursed. I mean, there's no, there's no way they could end up winning this game. I mean, they did call for SK in game one. Actually, no, to be fair, they did. They called SK in game one. They, they, game one. they were on a hot streak after game one, you know? That's right. That's, uh, that, that, that was what they were hoping for, at least. I feel like Rivals just playing so much more akin to how they played against Sanguine and Dignitas, where they're choking you out in the early game. They're getting this lane pressure. And SK just hasn't been able to, to get picks that can match it yet. I do feel there's hope for SK, though, with their composition as the game goes on. Hachiman definitely does a little bit better than Ooh in the later game. But Hachiman needs to live, first of all. And Zapman under pressure once more. Forced to beat and all. Oh, very good work. But now Polar Bear Mike's in trouble, ults himself. This won't really help him too much. He knows he's going to die. Because Sam right? is still in the sky. Okay, there we right. go. Well, I was gonna say, he's gonna die, Ooh. right? Eventually he does. Well, Bella, around the corner, teleporting in, trying to make something happen. Arkill forced to beat. Pandacat peeling for his hunter there. Great play from that Merlin. A good pick on to Polar Bear Mike, as it was Rival getting aggressive. And I like the idea, Belair actually backed and spent 500 gold. He upgraded his teleport to get to that fight. SK Gaming, you could tell that they're playing. Desperation sounds a little bit too negative. It's a little bit too negative of a context, but just the, they understand the stakes. They understand that they are on the edge. Of yeah, more freely, right? You've been a little bit more loose to try and make something happen. Because if you just keep playing the same way, it's going to be a slow trickle down loss more than anything else. Exactly. They understand the stakes right now of where they are in this game and the trend that it's looking like right now. If SK continue with the status quo, they're going to be down 2-1 and a game away from losing the world championship. So they're, they're trying to make plays happen, and that has the potential to widen the gap, which is the concern. That's why teams don't always play the risky way, but it also has the potential to get SK back in the game. We're almost out of the early game now and start to transition towards the middle game as Neil Bar gonna rotate into the pressure from Rival on this tier one in mid. And now we get to this moment in time, the compositions need to start to evolve. We'll see more team fights, and this 
is exactly what I was expecting. Still no anti-heal at all from SK Gaming. Paul goes Crusher, or Sam goes Crusher, Paul goes Fear the Magus. That means that Captain Twig's heal is gonna do a whole lot of work in this next pure Primal Fury fight. And here comes that Primal Fury pull, because Twig's already over there. Belair gonna lead the charge in for SK then, but Sam Fusaka is in base. And this is creating a bit of a situation as this Primal Fury will not take long against the Raijin. It's like a, a Merlin and a cool. And that Guan Yu Prot Shred. It's not just Merlin shredding the magical Prot Shred, oh, yeah. but it's also Guan, Guan Yu. Talu assaulting and strip away in those physical prods, letting Arkel do even more. It makes it interesting why we see that Sunder then from Mike, which he likes to go for, with a Talu assault as well. Arkel is pretty much true damage in at that point. Against Bel Air in particular. I'll bet you that's who they're going to be looking for more often than not. Neil Mob, of course, is going to be a target with this much prod tread as well. Fine, okay, got a little bit risky there, and overstayed his welcome, forced to walk defensively away. Neil on the right hand side, just saw a bit of pressure from Bel Air, but Panda Cat's over there to form it up too. Experience leads at the moment, ever so slightly favoring rival. The biggest one, funny enough, is the support situation. Yeah. Well, Mike is level 14 to the level 11 of Neil Mark. And this has been planned by SK. They've done this every game. Neil is not farming poorly because he doesn't know how to find it. It's that they want Neil to be behind so that Paul can be ahead. Lincoln from Neil Mars. Shuts down Fido K. Remember, no ult for Fido K. He did this last time. So the back line goes down for Soccer, forcing back Panica and his beads as Fido K pulled back under the tier one tower and executed through the ultimate of the Bear Mike. And now Captain Twig could be next on the list. For well, that wall from Sam for Soccer, unfortunately, for a classic teammate wall that cuts off his defense. But well, Belair still has Blink. Might still be looking for Captain Twig if he can find him on this blue buff. Belair, though, might go for this one. Twig dashes away. He did have Blink up and available. Wasn't so sure about that. And Twig put up more than he can chew. And Belair says, I've had enough of you stealing my blue buffs. I'm at least going to get a kill for it. Arkel could be in a little bit of danger here. Paul's going to do good damage now that he has Fear the Megas, but look at him standing tall, level 16, with a red buff. No, not a fear in the world. A little bit surprised by a couple of these kills that SK just got. A little bit loose from Rival all of a sudden for a moment or two at this tier one tower in mid. Felt really, what? What was that about? Like, fine, okay, back at it again. Clearly the team wanted to go for it, but there was no real commit. Well, I mean, think back to their set against Sanguine and their set against Dignitas. I feel like Rival did a lot of this. Early game pushing, just shoving you over, poking and prodding you. And those teams didn't do a good enough job of, of rising to that challenge, rising to the occasion. SK Gaming, we already saw Bel Air try and make the big play on the left-hand side by spending the gold to upgrade the teleport. They clearly understand that they are not in a good spot now, and they're going to try and make every defense that they can. I feel like that's the best response we've seen to a Rival push. And SK is still pretty far behind. Mike does a good job there, just avoiding a lot of danger in the jungle. Gets back towards his fellow teammates. Because at the same time as that was happening, we did see Panda Cat was basing there at the moment in time. We have a quick pause here in this one as the players get themselves sorted out on the stage. We stay at all tied then with six to four in kills. And I say all tied, but it is rival in the lead at the moment. About a 3k gold lead at the most like, experienced lead, I should say, and a 3k gold as well. I mean, both teams really pretty locked in, but it feels like the big differential right now is that Mike has been able to get so much more farm while not taking so much from Panda Cat to put him out right behind. It is noteworthy that Paul's been the same level as Panda Cat despite Panda Cat's team doing so much more in this game. That is the effect. I mean, that farm has got to come from somewhere to put PBM this far ahead. But he's been able to leverage those XP leads very, very well so far in this game. Feel like as this set goes on, maybe Neil needs to start being a little bit more greedy because they're punishing him for being so far behind. It is starting to feel like one of those best of fives, though, that we go two to two, isn't it? And then we get a, a wash in the last game where it's a stomp. I'm really a little bit concerned and nervous about that already because these two are really like throwing punches equally each game. Maybe, but I can see that we get stomps all the way until game five. I mean, Rival might stomp this one out. SK could stop the next one, and then we could have an EU special, a maybe 55 minute where everyone's just standing at each other. Stop reading it. Stop Sorry. telling people. Back in game we go as Twig on the horse. He's looking for Neil Marr at the moment. Neil's by him. Time and a great ult throws Twig into a wall, unfortunately. But now Neil's in trouble. All the time he was spinning around. 
Arkill was just hitting him in the back of his head. And that gets a nice pick for Rival there. And that's that XP deficit. Again, coming up clutch for Rival's side. Neil just can't withstand that much damage. And with that Rival, get a Pyromancer, and now it could be on towards a Fire Giant. Paul and Mike on zone duty, Paul in the middle area, away from the Battle of the Mongol. Mike has got a target in Bel Air, but Bel Air slips the net and returns some damage. The flames are causing a bit of a problem. It's Paul over the wall, the drums are sung, but it's not going to be enough to slow down Rival oh! until Sam turns up with a big ult. That's exactly what SK need, but Arkill still going to be able to chase him down anyways. Okay, so Panda Cat for Sam for Soccer and Zap. Good trade for Rival. But good news for SK is the Fire Giant isn't being done. Exactly. They needed something. A huge play by both Paul and Sam. Paul put out so much damage through the wall, and it's only getting to be more. This is right where Raijin starts to feel like he's actually a god. Yeah. He's actually doing things that you want him to do in the mid lane. As soon as he gets to the Divine Ruin or that Obsidian Shard, whichever direction Paul decides to go, it's gonna get even better. All about the choke points, and now Belair under pressure on his right hand side. The Tether is attached. Good blink from him. No ability is used, but Twig is not done just yet. The ultimate is still on cooldown for Belair. He's trying to buy as much time as possible. Get some reinforcements from Neil Moore, who peels away as many as he can, and Belair will escape that. Wow. And a huge, terrific emblem from Neil at the same time. I love that peel, but it costs him an awful lot. Two relics as well, right? And both relics. They need those if they want to try and take these team fights. And now Rival will know exactly what was just used there by Neil, so they'll know where the danger could lie. Quick rotation to the left-hand side. I'll pick up a tier one tower. Red buff is up, and the Fury is literally about to spawn two. Oni Fury at that. And this Oni Fury could just put a lot of pressure on this left-hand side, which could allow for Rival to look towards that FG once more. Sam has ultimate again. No relics for him. All is finished with Obsidian Shard. That's a big power spike. Fine, okay, trying to keep Sam for soccer busy. Neil Marbella leading the charge in for the Fury. As there goes Sam for soccer, pinned down by Polar Bear Mike. And fine, okay. Fury's respect, though as Twig marches on towards the middle lane where everybody from SK is trying to fall back to. Captain Twig looking for more, knows they don't have to worry about Sam for soccer. And now it's all focused on Neil Ma. Remember, no one relics to escape there. Ultimate cooldown. Rival played that well. And the Oni Fury is not the calling card now. It's turned their attention once again to the Fire Giant. They saw Belair just back on this ward by Blue Buff. This aggressive vision for Rival really paying off. They know this isn't the, the five on three it looks like. It's really a five on two. And it looks like SK know exactly what's going on there. As you say, I think we're going to go for the Fury potentially instead. So the Fury is dead. But fine, okay, doing a good job of keeping them busy in mid. FG then on everybody on Rival. 7k gold lead. And now they wander over here for this Oni Fury. I was putting out some good damage, but now they have to worry about this sustain coming, not just from Guan Yu, from the Fire Giant as well. It feels like just not enough of a prioritization of anti-heal for SK. Not a whole lot of invention from Rival there towards that Oni Fury. They were very patient. And Final K blinks to them. Paul, Paul forced to ult. Lord of the Afterlife used. Final K still attaching the Tevin to lower the damage down. Neil Mar in a world of problems. In the size gap, though. Where's Sam coming down? It's on our kill, but our kill's still alive! But Sam is not patient. And the cat erased him as Rival gets up to 12 in the kill column. Neil leaps away, but gets ruined around the corner by Mike. Fine, okay, juggled in the sky, and Neil will be okay. Oni Fury's still alive, by the way. And SK is actually buying quite a bit of time here on the amount that Rival's getting off the FG at the moment. They are, but SK's not farming during all this time. They're just fighting. Rival's gonna get farmed. They're gonna get the Oni Fury. They're gonna get towers. SK just being kept on the hook for so long. The rival Gold Fury won't have as much duration, but I don't think they mind much. Look how covered in fine OKs in the mid lane, keeping them busy. Oh, the Akjutsu from Zatman put him in a whole world of trouble, and he's forced to ult defensively. Bit of a split down from Rivals. He take a tier two on the left hand side and focus on tier two in the mid lane. I do love the Shogun's Kasari, funny enough, from Twig, which is going to really help out with this. Again, it's another good option to facilitate Arkel. Who's had a great game on this cooler? They first picked this selection not just because Arkill's great at it, but it takes away from Paul as well, which is huge. That's been the pick and man strategy against SK all year by every team. It's just making sure that Paul doesn't get those comfort picks. I just that one tier two tower stand on the right hand side for SK left alive. And Rival really thinking about how they're gonna try and do the siege up. Do you expect they do the same thing as they did just with the towers and split the map? Or will this be a five-man goon squad? 
Well, Fire Giant, they still have it for over a minute and a half. So I think that I'm looking to see a full five man running down here from Rival because they don't have a great split pusher that can, that can put a lot of pressure on you. Guan Yu wants to be near his teammates. He gets him those cooldown resets with a heal. You want him to be around your team so he can heal him up. I feel like that's the better option if Rival are even going to go for a few. 2-2 two, two flex option, maybe? Maybe put someone... I'm thinking someone like Kepri in between the two as they push, and then he can rotate and come with the ult, right? Sure, but he, you want him to root people for the initiation. Belair could get rooted in a second by the focus coming out there from the hall of Rival. Twig wrapping around the back, tier two falls on the right. Keep it on the left-hand side. Hachiman and Thor both trying to get back to base quickly. Zap, no ultimate available. All relics are up for SK Gaming, but Rival don't care. The frenzy was popped. The focus is on Neil Mar, and he evaporated. That was a tank. Oh, but look at the dodge from Sam for soccer. Arkill crushed again. And Twig, though, caught off by the wall. He gets a really good blessing on a mic. That'll keep him alive. And meanwhile, Paul's just hovering, can't do much. Oh. But Zapman goes in. He tries to turn it around. Final K jumps to the back and takes his life and forces Paul away. It's only Belair, Zap, and Paul left alive. This is pretty good for SK. Paul's got a lot of damage, but Belair has to be careful. These are two tanky warriors. Look what Mike's doing, zoning back the damage deal as best he can. Anthony Bellow on the island. But the problem is, like you said, it's tanks versus tanks. But Paul is still in this mix, and Sam for soccer has a damage build. Paul still looking for a little bit, but he's so tentative on when he wants to go in. He hasn't cast a spell in 20 seconds. Being very patient here. Paul so low. Fine, okay, no ultimate execute blocked by Captain Twig to keep fine, okay, safe. Obviously, there was a conviction there as well to top him with his health bar. But SK Gaming just held against the Fire Giant Team rival who popped Frenzy and killed Neilmar right at the start. I mean, Neil links in, but that's the end of the effectiveness. He doesn't get a chance to get anything off. He, does, he still has Horrific Emblem, which is, I think, a very smart pickup. One of the only ways that you could actually heal some of this damage that Captain Twig is doing is by hitting him with that increased Horrific Emblem to shut down some of that damage output. But he never used it in that fight. Another huge dunk from Sam for Soccer. Do not forget. That SK Gaming is one of the best Ooh. defensive teams in the league. Neil Mar under a bit of pressure there, but our kill won't be able to find him in time. Does give a bit of a relief for SK Gaming just to catch up on a little bit of farm across the map. Try and push out these waves for a second or two and reset, relax, and focus on finishing some vital items. Fire Giant's gonna spawn again. It's not gonna be the enhanced one just yet. And with a Thor, you've always gonna take into account that that global pressure that he can bring could really change and turn the tide of the battle as well as FG. And Rival's comp is falling off. This Guan Yu jungle yeah. isn't going to be as good at dealing damage. It's really just there as another tank. The East Staff is done now for Paul. If SK can somehow hold on until Paul gets Soul Reaver, I feel like SK's actually in a pretty good spot. A little risky from Final K and my option there to take that TP towards the FG that he just did, because he won't be able to get back to the fight again if this is an extended version, and they may need him. Meanwhile, Bel Air has that teleport available, so he could go in twice if need be. Rival need a good fight here, but so do SK. This battle at this stage of the game could swing it in SK's favor or close out for Rival. Still no Aegis for a little bit for Panda Cat, so he's really the most vulnerable on the map, besides Zapman, who has no relics at all. For 10 seconds on Beads, 25 on Aegis. Both teams being very cagey at the moment as Twig slips on the back, blinks in, looks for Paul, who dashes away. And as soon as that dash is done, Twig's still going. But the damage on Twig is pretty heavy, and he has to fall back. Meanwhile, Bella gets the Panda Cat and forces defense. Panda now under pressure from Sam, but Sam's Aegis and Beads buys in time. He's oh, bit for damage, and in comes Neil. Paul is fine, so he's up, but Twig gets up for soccer. Belair couldn't find it with the execute, but still gets Panda Cat eventually. Paul, plenty healthy on the Fine, okay, he's dealing with the carry of SK Gaming and the Tether caused so much damage that our kill would rain the damage from the sky. He's going to chase onto Neil Mar, who is slowly limping away back towards his Phoenix. And our kill gets himself a double kill. Man, so close for SK, so close. Sam does so much damage with that spin. Still had the arcing lightning bolt. It's up to Paul to try and defend this height. But with no ultimate available, this is going to be a tricky task. Both relics are up, however, and the Raiju will spread. The Phoenix falls on the right-hand side, and Rival will fall back with only a couple of members here and find OK on the manual rotation. Tell you what, putting up that TP, if that was up, I think they could have ended there. 
Yeah, yeah, probably. That would have been an extra tank, but no wave. Paul doing good damage at this point. A little bit too risky. I, I don't think Paul should even be considering walking into this fight. I mean, I'll be surprised if Paul goes because he's one of the safer players that we've seen in the league. There'll be a few people upset about that knockout, but I don't think anyone will be unless they get punished for it. Belair comes in, and Belair's eating a ton of damage here. But Sam was with him, and one execute, two executes. Can he find a third? Paul's drop to set it off. Belair's still here. Can I have the third? No, Panda Cat says. The blizzard slows it down, but Neil Mars back. No blink for him, but he still has ultimate, but so does Fine OK, so he's chilling as long as he holds on to that Lord of the Afterlife. Paul and Sam a little bit worried about the overaggression. I like it. Stall out from SK again. Rival. Sure, they got the FG, but it's not on our kill, and yep. it's not on PBM. Yeah, this is actually really good for SK Gaming. Like I said, their late game is, I think, far better than Rival's. Rival's got this great front line, but we saw it even before on this fight that happened in the lane on the right-hand side. Twig just can't ult in front of Paul anymore. It's getting too late in the game. Getting a couple of flashbacks to yesterday with SK when they were down quite considerably against the Renegades and battled their way back into it. Zap, taking it a little bit risky here at this stage of the game, but a good call to pick up that Fury. They should be impactful. Wow, this is risky. Spino K has Blink. He sees Zap at that low HP. He's going to go for it, but that's huge that SK get that Fury just for a little bit of gold. Paul needs to finish that Soul Reaver that is going to be absolutely critical. And Sam not going for a Heart Seeker this game. Worried about all the front line. Instead, going pure pen. He's got every single item in the Mace Tree right now. And as soon as he finishes Titan's Bane, Captain Twig is going to really struggle. And now it's up to Rival to really continue to pressure, because if they don't soon, SK are going to hit Max Bill to join what Rival already have in their inventory. The pressure to the left hand side is the focus because fire minions will be pouring on the right. The pings and the minimaps are definitely there from Rival to say, look, Sam is on the right hand side. He has the rotations. We should be looking to take a fight. Paul's going to be here to clear wave in mid, but that means that there's not a lot of poke damage that Rival has to worry about about on the left. Sam back from base and Twig is on that middle Phoenix. Paul very careful about overextending for that 1v1 with the Guan Yu. The left hand Phoenix did get chipped out for a second or two. It should be fine for now. It's all about getting our kill in here if they can to get that damage off. But he's got no relics, so he really can't afford to step up. He's perched the Mandal of Discord, so that helps, but still a little bit too risky. And the route hits Panda Cat. That's a good work from Sam for soccer over the wall. Just the edge, the very tip of that wall did connect and set up that option. So it'll keep Panda Cat in an awkward spot, but they know where Sam is lurking now. Just waiting for the right opportunity. Fine, okay. Setting up the front line. FG's got a bit of time in this. Still over a minute, and that right side is starting to group up with fire waves. Rivals playing this patiently. They know SK doesn't have to make a move yet, but as soon as those fire waves build up on the right hand side, they will. Worst case scenario, they get a Phoenix again, because those that Phoenix should respawn. Or maybe not. That whole minion wave might go in. Here's the commit on the left hand side. Find okay, Mike and Swig all in deep. Neil Moore is nearly dead. At least he got the spin up inside, but Arkill gets the kill. Cap Twig solo, another big dump from Sam but still has to back it up. Slows down Rival for a second or two though, and those fire minions are on the Titan right now. Someone will go back to defend eventually. It's two waves there, so that's why they're gonna have to be a man down again. Not only is Neil not there, Sam's not there. So Rival get the left hand Phoenix right about now. That is huge, man, and so close for SK Gaming. Look at the items they just need to complete. Soul Reaver nearly done for Paul, Odysseus Bow nearly done for Zap. Sam just now finishing the Titans main after the fight's already happened. SK so close in itemization to potentially taking that fight. Rival really trying to last, use the last few seconds of his FG. It's down in five seconds, but they want to get this Ryan Phoenix and do so with two seconds to spare. Panda Cat flickers away, changes stance, and everyone from Rival are leaving straight down this lane, back to base, resustain. Wait for the next FG. So nicely done by Rival. The, their, their ability to really take these leads and move them around the map has been so impressive. They've earned this number one seed without a shadow of a doubt. And they're showing it here, but I, maybe they've got one more good firefight that's in their favor because these Phoenixes are down. Still think that SK shouldn't be too upset about where they are. I, I think SK should take the fight of the FG. 
Agreed. This next FG, if, if well, the rival go for it, I think they need to commit and just go for it. I don't know. I mean, they've got you really so many fire waves to worry about now, it's especially on opposite sides. Bel Air doesn't really clear fire waves super well, so it's not going to be easy for him to just clear them out and teleport over. But if he could just hold the waves while his team tries to commit a 45 FG, I think it's a better look than, well, waiting for the inevitable, which will be rival charging the Titan. Fire minions be damned. They could just backdoor it at this point. Especially when Mike could just ult onto Twig and go, hey, here's a revive if you go tag this up for me with that amazing ultimate. Good point. Certainly uh, a concern, I think, if you're if you're gonna sit around your base, it's just the all-in potential that Rival has with this Kefri ultimate. 35 minutes is really the late game, and this is an enhanced fire giant too. So if SK Gaming do get this, they can whistle down the base of Rival quickly, and the respawn timers get longer if you die, the longer the game goes on. Those big items that SK needed, all done. Titan's Vein, Soul Reaver, and Odysseus Bow ready to go. But SK did not do a great job of pushing up their side lanes. Look at how far up these fire minions are. They're gonna realize and head back to base. They might have to give this up. And when Sam gets noticed, they're all zap. It'll be go time for Rival. Zap shows his face on the right side, first of all. And that's going to put more pressure on Bel Air, Neil, and Paul to try and slow down this FG. Rival taking it slow, though. Very slow indeed. Now Panda Cat gets in the mix. It's fine. Okay, zones away, Bel Air. Samson on the left hand side. This looks like SK are going to surrender this FG. I think you have to. I just think there's too much pressure on this left hand side to, to really end up helping on that right side. You just can't do it. Your, your defense was pretty solid last time. Not perfect, but okay enough. Problem is, if rivals do the same thing, they just stall you out on that mid Phoenix, they're gonna end up losing so much Titan health to those fire. We've seen SK in rough spots before this tournament, so we'll see if this is the real turning point. Tied up at one to one in this best of five finals though. And it's looking good for rival to be heading to, well, pretty much match point at that moment in time. They're looking good, man. I mean, they are right on the edge. I think that they've got a really good shot at doing it right here. And their momentum is going to be at an all-time high should they win this game, knowing that they're just one game away. All of them, Mike, just waiting for the right opportunity to go in with final K lead and Sam Pasaka from SK is on this right-hand side trying to keep these minions at bay. Love the wall there just to slow down that Magi's cloak. Make sure he doesn't have any CC immunity next time he comes in. Three members of SK on this right, and it's leaving Neil and Bel Air alone in the mid to try and slow it down. Rotation in from Paul and a damage check from both, and Miles Twig came round the corner. He's forced to ult away. Paul did use his ult looking for the cleanup kill, but didn't find it. And now Neil has to be careful in mid as Bel Air goes in, and Sam goes to the sky. He's found Arkle. No, he missed him. But Neil found two! Bel Air gonna execute the first two and the second! And now the third will not fall as Panda Cat answers him back with the blizzard! It's a triple kill for Panda Cat! But Zop might get himself a double! And Paul will get the deer side! SK Gaming hold the base! But now what can they really do? Well, they've got the FG's a... down! They've got to defend! You. They've got to defend! They've got to defend the right hand side and the left! The Titan taking too much damage. Can Paul do it in Yeah, okay. Yeah, just fine. about a little bit concerned for a second or two. But he's got to bend right. Still pushing down mid lane. He's got it back. And he? left hand side, right hand side. Stuck in the middle with a Titan. Paul, come back. We need you. No way, lose. Paul, come back. We need to defend the Phoenix. This is awful. They're not going to be able to save right side, I don't think. I don't think Paul's going to get there in time. No, he should be okay. I don't know, Archers. Zap still pushing down mid. Okay. Good call then from SK, I guess, because Zappi's looking for a middle Phoenix. Respawn timers, a few more seconds on Twix. Zap's not going to get Phoenix there. No, there's no way he gets that, but what a defense by SK Gaming. Now you are really worried about the all-in, because you have to wait until that left side Phoenix respawns until your Titan's going to start regening HP. The good news is Fire Giant wiped from Rival. True. Still not spawning for two minutes, so you've got plenty of time. I don't think you need FG, though, if you're Rival. No, you just go right side here. You just push the right side Phoenix, because SK has to be so, so worried about their left-hand side. And they've got to be careful of Twig. See, they watched Twig in that fight as well, early game. Right-hand side, the Ryan Phoenix. Three members were focusing Twig, trying to whittle down his health bar. And then as soon as he got forced away, everybody focused towards the middle area. Neil. Trying to front line here. Interesting fight, this one. 
I mean, this is exactly where Rival want to take a fight. No relics for Paul in the jungle, remember, but Twig taking a ton more damage than bargain for. Bel Air has to ult away from safety. Captain Twig, though, in no man's land, Neil might be able to get him with a roar. But Mike's there with a big ultimate to save his life. Zap into the fray, though, but keep an eye on Zap. No relics for him. Look at the roar. Look at Paul. He's coming around the back. He's doing so much damage. Ooh. Right, okay, he's got him. And Bel Air just teleported back into the fray. Twig falls down. No, Arkill falls. The left hand side. Look at this. Panda Cat. They're looking for a bit of a backdoor play. I think they are trying to this is going on. Zapper Soccer's going to be basing a wise play oh. from Sam because Panda's going to go for it, and he doesn't know. Oh, this is the worst mistake ever. Panda Cat's going to die. Panda Cat can win this fight, though. He can win this fight for sure, especially with PBM here. And, okay, Sam knows that he found them both, and the whole of SK is coming back. Neil's going to come back, as is Paul. No. He's still there. Bel Air is still there in mid lane. Respawn times at 30 plus seconds. Panda Cat going in. Panda Cat trying to make it happen. And it's not going to happen. SK Gaming are going to take the game. What? Are you kidding me? What? SK Gaming held a base with about 10% health. I cannot believe what I'm witnessing. How did they manage that? That is a motivation killer for rival. What a play from SK! Wow! They could not have done that any better. They, they keep exactly the amount they need back. They keep exactly the amount they need to end the game. SK Gaming, baby, I mean, they are locked in. Absolute composure in that situation. Two Phoenixes down. I'm like, I'm writing this one off. We're going to a game four, sure. I'm right now. There's no way that SK can get back into that, but they hold their nerve. And again, from a huge deficit, they win that game. Unbelievable. And that is the type of momentum that just destroys you as a team. Rival, but think of it this way. They did it already. They got stomped in game number one. They were able to bounce back and look really, really good in games two and three. They've got to remember that they were winning that whole game. They got to stick to the game plan, get fine okay ahead, keep Bel Air behind. They did a lot of things well. It was just that last little bit. SK's phenomenal defense comes up yet again. SK win that game. 2-1 to SK in the grand finals then. It's up to Slayer and Rival to bounce back and keep that momentum and get back in this set. We'll be back after the break. Heimdall, do you really think you can stop me? That's why I'm here.
Welcome back to the Alienware Lounge here. If you guys are enjoying, the, enjoying this My World Championship series, make sure to tweet at us at Smite Pro. Let us know how you are watching the series because we get to enjoy it from here. And let me just say, the crowd has been amazing so far. This has been some of the most hyped games we have ever seen in the Grand Finals. And that last game holds up. That looked like it was Rivals game until, what, the 35-minute mark? I mean, I, my, my mouth was agape walking down here. I, I didn't, what the hell just happened? Both sides of the crowd, very supportive for their teams. Rival at first, and then SK to end it out. And I got to remind everyone that the defense wins championships yesterday, SK versus Renegades. The only reason they found that reverse sweep was the incredible right side Phoenix defense. I mean, who do you even give credit to here? Sam, Paul, Zapman, all of them? The vocal leader. Whoever is making those shot calls towards the end, those micro decisions, that who, that's who deserves the credit. The first person in, Neil Ma and the Xing Chen, was the key to the success of SK's holds. So that ultimate, the whirlwind of Rage and Steel cut. Multiple members there, so many defensive relics having to be forced, and SK Gaming so confident. They are taking these fights outside of their own Phoenixes, outside of any safety structures. And that's where I go to the shot caller. If they take the fight in the base, they get walked past, the Titan just melts easily. They had to fight outside. They had to fight on that spot of the jungle. They had to have Neil go in. They had to have those, everything had to line up and it wasn't by accident. Also sends two people back to the fountain as well to defend because the uh, Panda Cat and Pibad tried to backdoor and like just everything was just perfect. I mean, let's talk a little bit about that backdoor there. We did see Rival try and take the Titan, with only two members up. That didn't exactly work in their favor. Was that just a last ditch effort? Was that them realizing that they were not gonna be able to hold this defense? They had to go on the offense and do a base trade? Basically, that was a last ditch effort. There was not really much that the Merlin and also the Kepri can do in, on the defense in the 2 one five. So their best bet is like, okay, well, if we can get in, have the Kepri tank the Titan, the Merlin DPS should have been enough. We saw the idea that SK had once they won that fight outside the middle Phoenix, somebody had to keep pushing, which was Zaman, and then somebody had to defend, which was Paul, and it was, Actually, very scary to see how Paul was defending that uh, Titan because it almost went down. He had to defend the first fire wave, go back to the right side Phoenix to make sure it wasn't going to go down to fire minutes, and then almost lost to the second fire wave. I didn't hate the call from Rival to just bum rush the Titan. I think that is the right call, and nine times out of ten, that's going to work out. And be, not even that, if it goes awry, you have a second shot. You don't lose the game off of that attempt. And I think that's why I had no problem with it. Go in, try and win the game. If not, oh well, you fight again, no big deal. But uh, you know, I, I want to say it on the big stage, so P's and B's pretty please for game number four. That's why you asked me to intro the picks and bands? Yes. All right, well, thank you, Web. Dot. Before the 35 minute mark there, the rival looked unstoppable. I totally understand now why Captain Twig's Guan Yu has been banned out in games one and two, and I can expect another ban from Guan now in game four. He felt very confident. He was always leading the charge, no pun intended, on the ultimate, but also his utility style. He built into the Shogun's Kusari for the extra attack speed of his backline carries. Arkel had a phenomenal game on that uh, Uller as well as Final Cage is zoning so well and effectively on the Osiris. Same thing with PBM, his Kepri ults were game changers there. It didn't really seem like Rival was doing anything wrong. Nah, everything's kind of working out here for Rival. If I'm Rival, that last one, I don't want to call it a fluke. It was absolutely mistakes that they have to improve on, but everything up until that point was was working flawlessly if i'm rival again i kind of just stick to my game plan yeah sure but one thing to keep in mind as well now like we've seen people try to ban out paul but i don't think you can anymore he does really well on the merlin and now on the Ryan. so much damage that game he did kind of struggle in the early mid game but so did his whole team so that was not on his fault i think so i don't really know how this Pretty tricky for Rival to draft there. He was very safe in the back line, just banging away at those Tyco Trumps because of how aggressive the rest of his frontliner was. So he was being left unchecked. We thought he was going to play an obscure pick, and we Is were proven correct there with I the right shin. It's something that. that he kind of had a lot of success with at the beginning of his SPL career. I love starting the draft off here with the Achilles. The Achilles has worked out for both teams, but Belair right now is on fire with this choice. Multiple double kills, triple kills, almost a quadra kill earlier on. These big moments, Belair stepping up. Zero, so your thought on this Uller ban where we just saw Arkel play him, not wanting to give that up to uh, Sam or to Zap? 
Yeah, it's just kind of interesting because like, I feel like both these teams have the two best Ulla players in the league with Paul and uh, Orkel. So definitely if you're second pick, I don't think you want to give it away. Even though Orkel did lose on it last game, still looked really good. So. Oh yeah, no, Orkel's Arkel, play on the Ulu was fantastic. And, and Orkel is, like I said, a rhythm player. And when he starts to feel it, he gets scary. Last game, the game before that, it was all Arkel, baby. Off near a band that we've been seeing in the last two games here, now being picked on the side of rival along with Thor, which we saw on SK's team last game. Yeah, I'm expecting double physical hunters now from rival with the Fafnir, the AoE coerce, and the draconic form. It's something it is they did yesterday when they found the 3 0 victory over Team Dignitas. Yeah, I would probably just want rival to pick the Poseidon next, but then they lock in the drop they want, right? And then, sure, they might get some hunters banned away, but they'll find two good hunters for the two lost picks anyway. It looks like Rival did agree that they can't ban him out, so why just let him have Merlin? It doesn't seem to really make too much of a My difference, theory. honestly. He's going to do well regardless if he has Merlin or not. Exactly, and for SK, as far as the picks here with Hunbats and Merlin, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is what SK has been playing all tournament. The the Achilles, the Hunbats, the Merlin. Keep giving it to they're in finals. It's working. Very smart Shin Chan ban if you're going to go double physical hunter. You got to worry about the Furrier Swore mitigating your basic attack damage. And then I would consider maybe even banning away the Kuma Karna. I said that's another great anti hunter pick. Neath ban coming out. One ban on either side of either team here. Rival really need to come out on top of this composition pick because, gentlemen, this could be three years running. Yes, it is a new team, but the rival team name has found themselves in this position three years in a row now. Very impressive stuff from the banner, even with different players within them. And they're in a great position. I still think that despite that loss, they shouldn't take it too much to heart. They're still gonna come into game number four with a blank slate. They've been tested before ultimately, and they have proven themselves in the past. I'm very interested to see if Rival's gonna go back to the ISIS here. Okay, okay it's gonna be the Poseidon. It's gonna be the double hunter. I really liked it for Rival. They are, now they have the Fafnir too. They will kill objectives pretty fast with a Poseidon and a double hunter. So I love this for Rival. I mean, the Fafnir is the final, final piece to that puzzle for sure. Well, speaking of the final piece here, we do have one pick left for our rival teams. Anatoly, how do you want to see this composition fulfilled? Uh, for rival, they still need another hunter, so I'm thinking that without Uller, maybe a Hui Yi would wrap, round out that draft really well. You need some team fighting ultimates there. You have a great long range setup on the Thor and the Fafnir on her as well. I'm expecting Panicat to really pop off today on this on her. I think we're gonna see Jing Wei again, like just, because they have on as the early game hunter, right? And then you have Jing Wei at the late game carry. So I expect to see the Jing Wei coming off arrival. And I think we're going to see Panda Captain Donner. Everyone's excited about the Bacchus pick. And we definitely saw Neil, I think it was day one, do some crazy jukes with Bacchus. I mean, they locked in the big boy. This is, this is the draft SK want to win the tournament on. They're going all in, Bacchus in. This is them making a statement. Yeah, you guys were just saying that this rival comp is good, but this looks like SK has everything that they want, maybe besides Hachiman? It's a very aggressive trap that I think can work if they come in and out in waves of aggression. First the Bacchus to engage, bait out the Kraken maybe, and then Hanbaz for round number two. Great team fighting potential from oh, SK Gaming. No Zero thoughts on this Erlang. So it's not gonna be the double hunter, I'm kinda, uh... I really expect a double hunter, but then again, Twig on the Erlang and Padna Cat on the Poseidon. We saw it in one of the SPL games, but I think we had a four-man Erlang out into a four-man Kraken, so... Yeah... I was so ready to say Rival, ready, set, go. The double hunter comp with Fafnir is, is how Rival has made their money. I was ready to say we're going to game five. I, I, the Erlang shed to the Poseidon. Totally you go, because I'm still thinking. I mean, I think that Arkel is going to be having a fantastic showing on the on her now with Panic Hat potentially on the Poseidon. We're going to need to see a lot from Captain Twig today onto this Erlong Shen and SK Gaming to react accordingly, have some good vision control, and be prepared to belly flop on in if you're Neil Ma. Yeah, both drafts still very good there. Even though Rival doesn't go for the double hunter, still a really sick draft. But then again, for SK, you have to worry a little bit. Very little peel. The Bacchus doesn't peel at all. Just initiate, Bats initiate, Achilles initiate. This Merlin and Hachiman's gonna be left alone. And like, we'll see if they can deal with the dive from Rival. What I like about SK is that they're, they're not all in, they're most in. They go all in, and then when Rival responds, Hood Bats can kind of 
set things on fire a secondary time. So SK have their ability to jump off and pull the parachute. Gentlemen, this could possibly be the last game of the 2019 Smite World Championships. Anatoly, I need your predictions. I think it's time for Sandman to finally get his first world championship. F. Scott, do you feel the same way? I love the drafts here. I think Rival, if Captain Twig steps up, will bring us to a game five. I think Rival has the better draft, but I still think SK is going to take it. All right, everyone. I think I'm going to ask our audience, who gives it up for SK? Thanks so much, Kelly, and the analysts on the desk. Well, the crowd is semi-split, I'd say. I think a lot of people want to see the Underdogs SK Gaming take the set here and now. But I don't know, man. I don't think Rival are out of it. Their composure in this one is going to be the biggest tell because of how well that last game went. If they can do the same sort of thing, it's hard to do a repeat of what SK Gaming just did. Exactly. It, it, look, Rival dominated the majority of that game. They did so well. So to, to put them in a spot where they can do the same thing again, I think they've done a good job with their draft. I think they've done a good job with what they've assembled here, but they've got to make sure that they are not on tilt after a really tough one. The crowd is so pumped for this one. That could be moments away from destroying a whole copy pasta that's gone on a very long time. But then again, Rival could be moments away from taking us to a game five, which could Lock this one in the history books is one of the best finals we've ever had on the world stage. I mean, that last game has got to be an all-timer, right? I mean, you think about yeah. the great games in world finals history. I think of Energy versus Obey Alliance and Variety's insane performance in, in a few of those games. Titan versus the Cognitive team in the game five. 100%. There have been some great ones out there. I think this set might have a chance to be better than all of them. Neil Maher on the aggression here, trying to slow down Captain Twig as Polar Bear Mike is paying some attention to that, but he misses the hammer, and that is gonna just slow everything down on that left-hand side. And talk about composure was a moment ago. Zap didn't even beat that. He didn't nope. free beats, he just waited. Just holding on, waiting for his opportunity, and this time, instead of going over to that speed bump, what a good presence of mind by Mike to go for a different option, but better by Zap to not get caught by him. slowing down the jungle as Sam has rotated from red to purple, but purple is on the ground, and PBM and Arkill turn tail to walk away. Neil on the rotation, but only at level one. It could be a tricky task of finding kills here. It's all about how he gets off to a better start in the jungle. And at the moment, Captain Twig is ahead on farm. I feel like this has been the, the start for the majority of the set so far is, is Sam being a little bit further behind Twig, Twig being able to, to keep his farm nice and safe. I feel like this is kind of how it's gone so far, but the big change up I want to see SK make is make sure that Mike doesn't get so far ahead in comparison to Neil Ma. Neil has done great work this set with limited tools, it felt like, because Mike has been so far ahead. Worked so far, but that doesn't mean it's the best option. I do want to bring up this Bacchus pick as well, because to be fair, this year, there's only really been two players I've seen pick up the backers. Funny enough, it's been Neil Ma and Polar Bear Mike. Yep. Why are we seeing it here? It's been a pick that Neil really likes it because it's a pick that still impacts the map when behind. That's all of Neil's picks. So he needs to be able to impact the map while still behind. And then come late game, it's an absolute monster. It, it's kinda, it kind of checks all the boxes for SK. Could it snowball the game an instant win for us? Yeah, it could do that. Can it? still be a factor even when it's lower in farm. Sure, belly flop's a great ability no matter how much farm you have. And then ultimately, if we're behind or we're in a late game team fight, can it win us the fight? And that is exactly what Neil has done. Well, I just saw some pressure there as Zap was getting aggressive. Arkill got upset and leapt, but his leap is on cooldown. And that leap being on cooldown could spell doom for Arkill, or at least his beads. He came back up in time, but he did have the beads. Bel Air, meanwhile, surrounded by three, and the Whirlpool will take his life. Handicap with a very early rotation. That's the difference maker. If that's just PBM and fine, okay, I think Bel Air is, is safe and sound, but with Panacat there, that spells his doom. Now, that's going to open up a good invade here by Zap and Neil. At least they get something. But with so much of this set being determined by the solo lane pressure, still has got to be at least a little bit concerning to SK that 
first blue respawn goes the way of Rival. Mike trying to slow down Santa Soccer again in the jungle. Left hand side, while this is happening, you can see the Panda Cat and Twig are looking at that red buff to strip it away once again from SK side of the map. Twig, a little bit of pressure from this belch coming through, but the beads will prevent the stun and the knock-up. And now that force oh, keeps the aggression going. What a sick play, but I don't know if they're gonna have enough. Twig is gonna kill. Kill. Down. down goes Captain Twig. Zap still alive. First blood goes down. What a play by Zap Man. The pre-beads to make sure he doesn't get knocked up. So then he can then interrupt the 72 transformations. What an unbelievable pre-thought and then a ballsy play, frankly. Who else would make that but Zap Man? The I just who play was crazy. It's a couple of times now that we've seen Zap use his escapes, which sure, most escapes from the Hunters do do damage, but we don't normally get to see them use it that way, mainly for defense most of the time. But Amher is one that we usually see use it. And now Zap is showing that Aijutsu on Hachiman is very useful. That is huge, too, because it just gives Zap that extra little bit of momentum. Our kill is on a god that is volatile on this lane. It can either get solo kills very easily, or it can get solo kills pretty easily. Now, Belair once again been overextended. Great knockup from Captain Twig to limit Belair's escape options. And it shouldn't take much to kill him. But the good news is Belair got his ultimate up in time. Back to tower safety. Still a win for Rival, though. Good job by Twig to just understand that he can take two tower shots and not worry. Leaping from our kill, and you don't know Neil Mars here. There's a fury to avoid the knock up, but Zap in trouble. Or is he? Zap and gets another kill. And it's Neil Mars that does most of the work there. Or is it? Because Zap did a good job baiting. Good bait. That's just a cla That's a good old fashioned zapulation right there, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't like that, you don't like Smite. That is that man playing with fire, as always. Composure from Arkill there. He's getting a little bit too greedy. He seems Zap's getting a bit of success with the aggression. And he's trying to nullify that for me a little bit. But he's not aware of his surroundings. And that's really punished him. No wards at all for Rival on the left side of the map. And that's where you got to go, hey, where's Neil? Where's the last time we saw Neil? Where's Sam? Have we seen him on the map recently? You got to have that timer in your head of how long it can take them ro to rotate from mid over to the left-hand side. I don't know if the questions weren't asked or the information was poor, but I know Arkill died for it. Even though SK is still down in gold at this moment in time, experience is relatively even across the board between the two teams. Basically the same at this moment. So even though it's a one kill advantage, that first blood from Rival and the way Rival have done well on this pressure around the map have allowed them this benefit. This is a much better start for SK Gaming with a pretty good early game fight for Rival. But that being said, it's Rival who's in the lead very, very slightly in gold, about 400 right now. XP pretty much even. So you've got a, a pretty even game so far, but it feel, still feels like SK has all that momentum. Neomar just zoned away Panda Cat there, but look at Belair on this right hand side. And that is an absolutely huge kill at this stage of the game. A Thor kill and an Achilles in lane? You don't see that. No, just a perfect execution by Fine OK. He hits a big power spike, just got his boots. Belair still hasn't got his. By the way, those blue buff invades coming back to be a factor yet again. He's sitting in boots too. Belair doesn't have the speed to get away from that dunk. And Fine OK uses his power spike to perfection. So great work from Fine OK then in his first World Championship tournament, to be fair. We'll see how this one continues as our kill. Still motoring ahead. He's trying to limit the Hachi man. But look at where Neil Mar is. In a position to maybe avoid some wards flop over. Hold it Mike. On the rotation, we'll spot this one out. You can tell that Mike is, is ready to defend Arkill because of that early lead that Zapman has. I mean, Zap's a level up right now. This is where SK is going to want to play around. Zap has just played so well with this big stage and all the lights on him. This is, this is what he's been waiting for, man. The World's Finals. We'll see how this works out. So the Mom Captain Twig does have a bit of a lead in the jungle. Talaria boots on line two. Look at the ward coverage right now for SK. I mean, they have wards absolutely everywhere. And Rival's got a couple. They've got really good aggressive ward vision around the red buff on the back harpies here for SK. But the ward vision overall from SK, is, it's all around Zap's side of the map too. Yep. They want to let Zap go aggressive. Because they left Belair on an island last game and sure he got behind, but they seem to be comfortable with that. They want to make sure the pressure's around the gold fury. So when you think about the gold fury, their damage output is pretty good at that objective. Yeah, it is. They've got they've got pretty solid amount of, of damages. Okay. okay uh, We're going to have a solid amount of fight in the solo lane. I say that as fine as the up down. But he's going to be very careful about the execute that is up for Bel Air here. 
was fine as she was baiting a little bit because Polar Bear Mike and Captain Twig are nearby. But with Sam for Soccer also lurking in the wings, that puts a stop to any potential rotation over. Sam going beads early on is tough. Speaking of rotations, there comes Panda Cat, but all over wards. Beads down from Arkill to avoid the flop, and beads from Neil avoids the Kraken. I'd say that goes in SK's favor. I'd, I'd agree. Neil can survive without beads, most likely. Arkill might not be able to. Interesting that Neil decides to go for beads at all in this game. Yeah. Because this Sunder pickup and that threat from PBM is just so much damage, and it's designed to kill the tank, so let's not let them. But, why, but the beads instead of the Aegis is a little bit surprising. I guess with the CC coming from Erlong Shen in particular, you really have to be worried about the Whirlpool Cripple stopping your belly flop. Beads lets you get out of the Erlong Shen nonsense and potentially flop away from a Kraken. You see Rival placing a couple of wards in that dual lane now, trying to answer back a bit of that vision that SK have wrestled control of for now. There's no sentries there, so both teams are going to have equal situational awareness on this left-hand side of the map at the moment. My attention does keep coming back the way Doug's showing us this lane too between these two because it's been fireworks all day. Yeah. Two have uh, definitely been popping off. Oh, standing tall there, funny enough. A rare sight to see, but it did cost him his beads. Now he's going to turn around as Twig gets aggressive. Neil is in tow. In the sky is fine, okay. Fine, okay. Thinking about it at the moment on that Thor. He's just hovering, lurking. He might just go for the blue buff. Probably the best call. Does he able, is he able to steal it away from Bel Air? He is. So that's a good, that's perfect placement for Final Gaze Ultimate. You can either affect the fight in mid or get that blue. Mike's a bit far forward, Fit No Evil prevents any transformation. And guess it was right alongside him. It's the Z-Man. Red at the right time. Uh-oh, Final K executed. One for one in the solo kill department. This underdog dream is starting to look more and more likely. Down a turning game three. Now up two games to one, and this is technically match point for them here. Yeah. If they can find this win, all signs are looking good so far. And Rivals just had a couple bad decisions so far this game. It's Arkill jumping in without any information on this left-hand side. It's Mike on the tower line when there's this much CC on the other side. Sure, he's not expecting Zapman to rotate in, but with Intoxicate there and Fear No Evil, I don't think it's fair to assume that you can survive that damage output. Look at this, the rival grouping up around the Gold Fury early on, trying to deward and start this one up. With an Anher and a Poseidon, it won't be too long, but the threat of a Bacchus Intoxicate could really turn the tides. Neil just has so much damage with these pen boots as well. I mean, he is committed to this damage option, and I think it's the perfect call. I'm seeing Fafnir with pen boots as a, as a surprise, right? It is, but Mike's got Sunder, so he could actually 1v1 someone without their dash. I mean, he can likely kill Paul if Paul doesn't have enough buttons to get away from him. Zap gonna eat a hammer and rotate towards this Gold Fury once again. Has a Sentry Warden in the inventory and that's why he's rotating there at the same time. Rival meanwhile pressuring mid for a second or two as Paul gets there to defend. And the red buff will go down for Rival. Still a lot of Rival groups to this left hand side now. And still good ward vision by SK on this left hand side. I mean, it's, they've got control of this little entrance where Neil Ma is sitting. They've got a sentry ward there. They've got a sentry ward on the Gold Fury. More lack of vision and information by Rival. Fine, okay, on the right side, and a lot of trouble. The execute from Belair didn't connect for the kill, but it will still set up for a nice turnaround. Belair, though, eats the Kraken from Panda Cat, and Rival make it one for one. But on the left-hand side, there's a dirty gang coming. That man going in on the R-Kill right away. Leaps over the top, pushes them back. There's a Fury good. Not enough damage, though. Intoxicate from Neil. And the flop. And Neil says, how dare you are trying to escape. Rival, though, do the right thing. They find some sort of global objective. Man, what a back and forth this has been, but this is a perfect call here by SK. I mean, they know that Rival's weak. They have to back. They use so many resources. It's just a matter of if Panic Cat can get in here and make a play. But I think this could be risky because he could get picked off himself. He will go for a steal with a turn away. SK can't get him, but he got Neil Mar in the sky. He's fine. Okay. Paul could end up falling down. What? Got a flicker? Are you kidding me? Oh, but a better wall. From Fine OK, what slick moves coming from Paul, but still not enough. What a sick teleport in from Fine OK to know that that fight was going on. Make that whole little clip a gift because Fine OK read the situation so well. And Panic has President on the line to make sure he friends that tidal wave in the right spot. 
Paul knew he was dead to rights there. Yeah, I think Paul just kind of makes the wrong decision. We know that he's coming in, but we know he doesn't have Kraken. Yes, he's got good tick damage, and so do you. You don't have great secure for SK, but I think it's better to get gold and then lose one or even lose gold but not lose a whole lot of members on the back end. Losing two members, even despite getting the gold fury, does feel a little bit worse. When it's all said and done, though, even with a gold fury and a pyro, then we're all tied up in this one. Still anyone's game. What an insane set this has been, especially considering how dominant Rival looked earlier. Mike on this left-hand side needs to be a bit careful as he gets aggressive. Zap knows what he's doing now. He's hunting Arkill. Remember, Arkill has no beads. And against the fear, no evil, and a belt from Neil. Arkill falls again for his third death this match. Feeding Zap Man, man. Zap is eating on this left-hand side. Level 13 now, matching that of the solo laners. 3-0. For him on this Hachiman, and, and, and I love the, the presence of mind from Rival to try and rotate over, but it's still not going to be enough when SK has got the numbers. Nobody want to see these gangs go on, though, when I see Sam involved in this. I'm like, well, Sam's sacrificing his form and experience, so Twig should be ahead, right? But when I look at the, you know, the experience and the level difference, Twig is behind, and I'm not seeing him in the action yet. Yeah, I think that one of the best parts about Sam's play this weekend, and there's been a lot of highlights, has been his ability to find farm where it's a meta that's difficult to do so. It is hard to find farm as a jungler right now to stay stay on track when you get invaded. I think Sam has done the best so far in making sure that he is staying even or ahead, even in tough situations. Zap knows about these sort of ganks when four members group up to the left-hand side. Rival are really trying to limit what Zapman is doing because this lead is causing a problem. Red Buff is currently down at the moment as Panda Cat and Mike have to rotate back towards mid. Belair, though, got a bit of free time at that tier one tower. That was very well worked from Belair on the right hand side. Look, Final K makes a huge play by teleporting into that left side Gold Fury fight. He sets Panda Cat up for a huge double kill, who Panda Cat is really big right now. He's 4 0, level 14. But it costs him a lot on that right side. Final K ends up falling behind a little bit, loses a bit of the lead, and loses tier one tower fairly early. Rough situation for Rival, but I do not count them out because I'm looking at this path now as this game goes on too. It's not something we've seen too much of so far in this tournament, but the one thing that will bring is the empowerment of some of these auto-attack-based characters. It's huge, and that's why I'm really surprised, along with a lot of the analyst desk, that, that we did see the Double Hunter yeah. position for Rival, especially with that Poseidon in the jungle. I feel like it would have been so good. But you still have another auto attacker in Erlong, yeah, so he still really benefits from that course. And that really will help him to swing a little bit longer and harder as that now takes on Twig. All for all exchange between the two. Favor anyone? I think it favors Rival, because Zap's just been running it down with that ultimate so often that at least it gives our kill a moment of reprieve. I could do a bit of pressure, but leaps away from the flop in time himself. I do want you to note, though, that Rival's main carry in this game so far has a two level lead in the mid lane, Panda Cat. 4, 0, and 0 on this Poseidon. That's a really good look at this moment. It is, and he's so critical to this composition because of his ability to shut down this mobility that SK has. It's already caused Bel Air a problem in this game. It will continue to cause all of SK gaming problems with this Poseidon Whirlpool. And alongside Captain Twig, I know he's not matching that pressure that Sam has so far. He's behind, but he's really there to facilitate Panda. Pressure from Mike in mid on Paul, but Paul avoids the hammer. Now Neil. Pressures Polar Bear, Mike and forces him to leap away. Blink in though at the same time from Sam after that. Here comes Belair, forced to beat. And Belair is under pressure. He's ages part in some time. Neil gets the kill on Panda, but Belair dies. Neil still in a bad spot. Wall doesn't land that time from Fine OK. And it should be a one for one mid for solo. That monkey toss from Sam just slowed him down for a second. Hunters may meet on this left hand side. And Arkill gonna get the better of that exchange. Look, man, I mean, Panda Cat does as, as well as you can ever do in that spot. I say it a lot. When the enemy team wants you dead as a mid laner, they will kill you. It's a matter of how much you force them to expand, how much you force them to do. Nicely done there by Panda Cat. He makes sure that Belair goes with him with a really, really nice Kraken. Nicely done from Paul there. That mid lane forcing the beads out of fine OK. Will really delay a little bit more of this aggression that Rival was starting to try and get onto there. Love the rotation from Final K in the fight too, because it really made a turnaround for when Bel Air was getting aggressive. Look, if you're not rotating early on Thor solo, you're doing it wrong. Final K is, is really putting on a clinic on how you want to play this god in this lane. He's affected fights on the left hand side, he's affected fights in mid, and we're not even 18 minutes in. Oni Fury has respawned, and now the aggression will begin once more. Oni Fury at this stage isn't the greatest thing in the world, I feel like. It's still balanced, though, this one. So that farm may just go the way of 
well, just far more than anything else, but it could have a knock-on effect if a couple of people die. I agree. I do think that Oni is at its weakest in situations like this, where the game is completely even, you're at parity, you don't really get an advantage, you don't have an opportunity to start pushing with those Oni waves. I know Case Hammer being down on that double tap means that he's forced to ult away. Twig comes in, but he's a fear no evil. He will re-sustain, however, and in goes Neil at the same time. But okay, went right to the back line and gets out of danger. But Panda Cat with no relics, he's got no escape. Neil still hunting on the final game. Blink, no stun, no life. Double digits for SK Gaming. And now the Oni Fury could be on the cards. Rivalry group on the right hand side. High Romantic could be an option, but first of all, they'll catch Bel Air, who was a little bit too far forward there, not all scared of the choke point. But the crowd is pumped for SK Gaming. This should be Pyromancer for Rival. They've got the Fafnir Coerce already there. Captain Twig wasn't there right away. That means their DPS is low. Neil Mars trying to get it in time, but Rival do get it. Paul with the Blizzard over the wall was close, but not close enough. Zap will get a tier one tower on the left. And let's go to the grass, Doug, and see where we stand. At the moment, it's a lead. It's not a whole lot of one, though. It isn't, but you can feel it in the building, can't you? I mean, the, this momentum that SK is getting, the, they're a bit... When was the last time SK lost a fight? It was a long time ago. It was right side tier two it's tower. Even. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been a while since SK outright lost a team. Nice and pale from our kill, but Neil Murray's hella tanky at this point in time. Polar Bear might hover in. They're trying to take out Bacchus, maybe catch some more. Good ult from Fine, okay. Good pick, but can they get more off this? They might be able to. I mean, Mike has just been able to get by his upgraded Frenzy. He already has Relic Tagger. This is a good opportunity now for Rival. I think you absolutely go for Tier 1 on the right-hand side of the well, period. Mike doesn't have his ultimate available. He's going to be basing here. I think if he may have had that in the Frenzy, could have been a look at the FG. However, SK are here in force just to make sure that isn't a possibility. Once Rival realized that Zapman is over here, level 18 Zapman, by the way, that's enough to scare them off. I, I, I know I wanted them to go for the tier one and right, but with Zap here, it's too difficult. Sam so gonna head back, still not died so far in this game on the Humbats. I wondered how Sam would perform because his Thor games have been very good. His other picks, he's kind of struggled here or there. Well, Humbats is really coming out for him very effectively. I, I feel like Sam's been the most consistent performer so far for SK. The, the one bad game he has, the Susano game, it's because he's unable to play. I mean, the rival just pressured too well. Otherwise, I feel like SK has really leaned on Sam very, very heavily so far in this set and the rest of the sets this weekend. His, his set against Renegades was just unbelievably good. Keep it on Twig, by the way. Gone for the Heart Seeker after a winged one, or wing blade, I should say, as well. Why the winged here? There's not too many slows, is he? I mean, Paul's slow is really, really impactful. That That's the really big one you're worried about. Zapman's ultimate also slows, and sk has been using that as an initiation. Now these choke points could become dangerous for rival, especially with Paul lurking around on the Merlin, putting down the blizzards and the flames everywhere. See how Sam is positioned near the middle area. He wants to flank round the back, look for a blink or somebody that gets whittled down and eats the full damage of this assassin. No way that Sam can find his way into the back line without someone spotting him. I like Rival's positioning on that left-hand side, but still a little bit low on wards. Good ball from Fine, okay. And he will escape Sam Fasaka, who did somersault into that fray there. And it's just a battle of farming and dancing at the FG. I don't think he, either team fe really feels comfortable to initiate on the FG just yet. How could you? I mean, the, the lead is just too small for SK, but Rival playing a little bit more patiently. This is the first time it's felt like that Rival's trying to play the counter initiation, and Erlong Shen, one of the best at, in those moments. His ability to find multiple backliners or multiple frontliners with a blink nine turns blessing could be the determining factor in this game. Do you notice that Paul as well went for the Kronos Pendant this game in the Merlin? Most of the time we see him go for a Breastplate of Valor, a bit more defense. But this is, I guess in a weird way, it's more damage, but it's a, it's a form of defense in a weird way, because cooldown means he can get his flicker up a little bit sooner, or even more damage. Sure, it is surprising with both an Erlong and a Thor on the other side, that's two good dive characters that Paul doesn't go for the Breastplate this time around. Especially when Neil is going to be doing good damage as is. I feel like this is the game where Breastplate makes the most sense. But Paul stays away from it this time around. Yeah, I wonder if Rival will recognize that then and start to realize that maybe picking this Merlin is a little bit easier than it has been before in previous games. Fine, okay. 
on the front line there, forced to jump away from the plot from Neil. Well, that's go time for Polar Bear Mike if he can find a hammer. He's having a tough time with some of these hammers at the moment. Gap actually uses the beams as Neil's gone in. Because Neil went to the backside and there goes Sanford. I'm gonna fear no evil. And it's all kill. The Aegis walk right from the right side for the overhand smash. And now Mike has one health left. And I'm landing or transforming a touch shade. He won't stay longer. The duo lane of rival is kaput. Man, this this in and out by by SK is so beautiful. Neil blinks in, gets a couple relics, forces rival back. And then Sam is right there to capitalize. Captain Twig, the only one nearby, and I don't think there's much he can really do here. Once again, the crowd are chanting for SK. They can sense blood in the water of how this is going. And they should be. They should be excited if they're SK fans. This is looking good, but it's only a 4K lead right now. Rivals doing the right thing. They're splitting the map. They're trying to get a little bit of gold going in their favor. SK, they don't even look like they want to keep everyone here in force. They don't need Paul, or Sam rather, to get this tier two. Belair does have a TP up as well, so he could teleport back if he's required. So he'll need the troops on for now. I guess getting Sam that little bit more farm will allow, allow him to finish off that fine line, which I'm guessing is gonna be what, Jotun's to uh, Titan's Bane? Probably a Titan's Bane. I mean, he's, he's already at 30% CDR. Would be a little bit awkward to end up going over capped on that. Surprised no Heartseeker for him yet, but that might be what he's waiting to sell his boots for. One of the reasons I'm surprised by the Heartseeker coming out there from Captain Twix, that's ability focus more than anything else. Whereas the Chins makes a lot of sense with the auto attack and the Fafnir they've got on the team. But I guess it's a combo of the both then. They both your abilities and your basics and clean in house. I mean, Twig is just trying to set up for Panda Cat in these fights and Arkill. So if he can contribute just a little bit of extra damage with that Heartseeker, then that lowers the kill threshold for Panda Cat and for Arco. That's really what he's going for. Okay, well, if you're a rival part of this moment after that Primal Fury, you're hoping they can do what SK just did in game number three and turn this one around now because they're on the back foot. And when we turn towards defense, not the worst in the world, to be fair. These pillars from an Anher can really make an difference here. But not only that, I'm looking at the four. Yeah, absolutely. Final K can do exactly what Sam did last game, find these later on initiations in the team fights, prevent SK from ever being able to set their feet. And Panda Cat's got to find some follow-up here for Captain Twig. Twig just has been unable to find anything super solid as far as an initiation goes. You can see how much Rival have been struggling here. Look at that player damage on that bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Four members of Rival are the bottom four. And normally, that might not be too bad, apart from two of those are the carries. I wonder if Sam's gonna use the blink ult here just to force the beams from Final K, or maybe even the ultimate. Sam's got so much CDR with this build, he can really afford to. Oh, Final K is under a lot of pressure. Will use the hammer jump away in time, but his somersault will claim his life. And now it gets harder. A four on five for the good news of your rival. The fear no evil is down. And Sam's purification beats, but losing Final K is a huge deal. Sam's got tons of CDR, 30%. That fear no evil is not going to be down for long. Roughly a 9K lead then for SK. All groups in the middle lane, no side lanes pushing up. It's all about the initiation. Keep an eye on Neil going in the belt. Some Panda's good, but a good impale at the tail end from Arkill. Slows him down. Belair gets eat, hit by the Kraken after the blink. But what can we see? The Phoenix is still fine. No hammer there from PBM. He misses that. That man's fairly low. Good pillar placement by Arkill. It's impossible to get through this. Would be nice to have some minions. Neil will step up though and he's a bit of poke once again. Jump into Belair from Polar Bear Mike there. And Belair forced to ult away. Rival hold the base against an FG 4v5 situation. Love the play from Neil, though. I mean, he's making sure that Panda Cat can't play the game the way that he wants to. He's forcing him to use relics too early. He's forcing him to use his Kraken in spots where he doesn't want to. Belair tank switches perfectly with Neil Ma. Neil blinks in, uses his buttons, flops out. Belair blinks in right away. So they're still looking at Neil, then Belair gets to eat. If they start looking at Belair, then Neil's out. It's hard to deal with, man. It is, uh, these backliners need a little bit of help. Now, the gold is the only real thing separating these two at this stage of the game. We hit the late game marker. Everybody pretty much hits level 20. Sure, supports don't matter too much of being where they are now. But the gold differential, 10,000 gold is a big difference. And you can see that in the items more than anything else. There's almost a whole item, almost an item and a half in the lead here for SK Gaming. 
And not yeah. only do those items give you damage, they give you more survivability. Absolutely. I mean, XP is, is no longer a factor. Every carry on both teams is already level 20, so that's not a huge concern, but itemization certainly is. Bel Air, full build. Sam, full build. Paul, nearly there, just needs to finish off Soul Reaver. Neil, five full items. And then Zapman, almost there with just the Titans being two. This is, a, this is an uphill battle for Rival. I wonder if they're gonna try and defend this Fire Giant. I feel like the Phoenix defense might be a little bit too difficult. This is where it's hard though. I mean, I don't think their defense is that sick anywhere, to be honest with you. I feel like you just want to get SK on the back foot, but SK's done such a good job of taking care of their homework. Wards, again, everywhere. I feel like SK has just been the better warding team all day. And as you see that meteor land, it's actually the fire giant respawning once again. Do you wait if you SK for the enhanced version to be up before going for it? No, I don't think so. You don't want to let Rival get any more extra golden experience than you need to at this point. I mean, it'll probably just naturally happen that it'll be enhanced by the time you start pulling it anyways. Take into account as well, SK Gaming did get at least one Primal Fury so far this game, and that will limit some of the damage that will be done to them by that Fire Giant, but also how quickly they can burn this one down. Rival need to be a little bit ready, a little bit earlier maybe, for this situation and consider the options, but it is something they should be defending. Final K is on that left-hand side, but he doesn't have his teleport upgraded yet. He's actually gotten offense as well with the build. Brawler's beat stick into what's going to be a heart seeker. Playing from Neil, but prevented by Mike. Or oh, was that an impale from Arkham? I'm not so sure. I thought it was a hammer in the jungle, though. Twig under pressure has to ult away. Still under pressure as Paul Rose sitting in. And there's the oh! and two, but a cracker preventing most of the damage. Arkham with a desert fury kills Paul. Rival are doing okay here. Final case teleported around the back, but he's not gonna get there in time to save Arkill. And Arkill down, but Zapman could also die soon. Final K can't find the wall, and I jump through from Zapman. Ends the health bar of Final K. Zap giving chase, Zap getting the kill, and Zap might just be winning a world championship. They're right on the edge, Hindu. They might be able to just run it down and end right here. Only Panda Cat and Mike alive. Mike transforms early. Panda Cat with him. The crowd is chatting SK. But first of all, they have to get through the Phoenix. It's a half health and twiddling fast. Oh, they're going to go for it, Hindu. Midnight has not struck yet on this Cinderella story for SK. I don't know. I don't like the look of this one, they boys. They're gonna play this patient, and that's what I'm talking about all set with the composure aspect. Because yes, I think you could have ended there, but why make a mistake? Why make a mistake of Because we we'll lose the world champs. Because then what you just did to Rival could happen to you. Rival was on the edge all game. Last game, and you did they didn't get a chance to close it out. Captain Twig's short respawn timer, a huge factor in that moment. I mean, we're just now passing the 30 minute mark. It's, it's very difficult to end the game with such short respawn timers, but here's the problem. I mean, Rival, they only lose mid Phoenix. It's not that bad. Are they gonna go for FG now? Rival have a chance. Neomar on the way. The pressure in mid from SK is good. And now Twig going in on Paul, but Paul flickers away. Zatman could be in a different story. No relics for Zatman, but he had to Horsey. And Horsey, Horsey, don't you stop. Fido K, Fido. A Fido getting it across to the back. That's it.
Threads of fate hold the answers for those worthy. One thread, a defender of Asgard, with eyes on the horizon over the Bifrost, Heimdall. Another strand to the east, a land of warriors as plentiful as trees, with one rising above all. Deeper still into the woods, there resides a home, a home. That is a sanctuary for none, but Baba Yaga. Darker still, the infinite abyss rushes like waves, and yet more comforting than what lies beneath. However, even the darkest night gives way to the light of the moon. But that's a tale for another time. The threads of fate bind us all. What will they hold for you? to High res Expo. I'm Tom Banager, and I'm standing with people much more successful than I am. SK Gaming just took the Smite World Championship. It was an arduous path, and right now I'm gonna talk to Neil Ma. You guys weren't invited here. You guys forced your way here through placements. The floor is yours, tell me the story. I don't know, we just, we just worked really hard this year. We really uh, hammer home some fundamentals that we try to fall through it every, throughout every set. It was really helpful because every time we felt excited or stressed, we always said, just back to the fundamentals, back to what our team's about, trusting each other and just having good drafts. And I think uh, we just did a really good job not getting, not getting too down this weekend. We were behind a lot this weekend. We were tested a lot this weekend, and we just decided to take it one game at a time. I'm going to stick to the storyline. You guys were four and five in the first phase. You guys were four and five in the second phase and then you take home the trophy. You mentioned a lot of fundamentals. How did you guys find the internal strength to really stick it out? Uh, internal strength, I think that we're all just, we get along pretty well outside the game, which is really helpful. So when things go wrong, it's like, ah, uh, no big deal, dude, shrug it off, you'll get it next time. Everyone misses stuff. We should have a group of guys we know that they'll miss less than other people we could be playing with. So it's all about just having a good time. We all trust each other, we all like each other, and that's just really the way we always stay in the game. There's a lot of different people on this team. We've got Neil Ma, who's been around the scene for a long time, but just now kind of stepping up. Zapman, I mean, you're as old as dirt. These guys over here as well, some new blood here. Sam, you've been around. You care about this. Talk to me about the heart that this means and what this means to you. Uh, I don't know, man. It's just kind of pretty surreal, you know? It, it, Paul said, like, it feels like we're, like, dreaming almost, so I don't even know. This is just so crazy. A lot of people, basically, you play it off. But anytime you talk to any of the pros, they say Sam's one of the most passionate guys. Can you uh, open the book? <laughs> no, I don't know. I didn't think so. I went for it, but we're not going to get it. Sam, stoic as ever. Zap, man, come here real quick. Zap, launch tournament before that, SiegeCon, PAX, a lot of tournaments, a lot of emotions. What does this mean to Steven Zappas? I mean, it means everything. Trying to win Worlds has pretty, pretty much been my motivation of, you know, keep playing Smite. And I found a group of guys that, um, you know, they were great to work with, shared a lot of my philosophy about the game. And just, it's just so incredible. I'm so happy. And, uh, you know, I've always wanted to tell my parents that I finally won this tournament. So mom, dad, I finally won Worlds. We did it for the island. Did it for the island, yeah. 
You talked a little bit about what it meant to you. You mentioned your teammates here. Like I said, you're the veteran. You've got some rookies from last year, some new blood, some old blood, a nice mix. What's it like leading these guys down the pathway? I think Neil hit it on the head. It's fundamentals. You know, a lot of guys have raw talent, but they don't really understand necessarily the scope of the game and how a lot of things tie into winning or getting ahead or getting that lead. And these guys were all very open-minded about things I preached and all that other stuff. Plus, they're raw talent. They've become incredible players. It was a pleasure to work with them all. Speaking of incredible players, Paul, come over here real quick. I want to talk to you a little bit. Your individual prowess is what put you on the map. What was it like playing on this stage and uh, actually getting your hell? Um, dude, this is crazy, man. Is this a dream, bro? Like, holy sh um, Yeah, I don't know. It, it was fun, and uh, yeah, it was, it, this is a dream. <laughs> nice job. Last touch. I want to talk to Belair over here, man. You and I, good friends outside of the game, in the game. We'll see. But no, congratulations. Great stuff. Your Achilles was nasty. What do you have to say about the Worlds? I just feel really good right now. My chest is like <laughs> just shaking nonstop. I just can't stop. That's the pure emotion, man. You love to see it. That's what this is about. It's my world championship. It's about the game, but it's about the people. It's about the heart. And of course, it's a team environment, but there is a most valuable player. You guys look fantastic all across the board when it comes down to it. I think the leadership put a lot of work into it. I think the players put a lot of work into it. But at the end of the day, the most valuable player we have discussed behind the scenes, Sam for soccer. Right over here, you are the most valuable player of Smite World Championship. Come right over here. Fantastic, fantastic performance. The jungle, jungle of driven league. Erez, bring the man the trophy. This is the big man, Hyrus. Long time. Erez front and center here for always. As we said, a lot of history here. Last Lex Man, MVP, what's it mean to you? I mean, it just means the world. I don't know. But, I mean, honestly, everybody just played so well. I feel like anybody could have won this MVP on our team. It was just a complete team effort. Basically, every game it feels like. So, yeah. SK Gaming, take it. Fantastic play. Zapman, Neil Ma, Sam for Soccer, your world's MVP. Belair, Paul and L Chuckles, they put the work in and they got the results. SK Gaming, your Smite World Championship winners. Thank you for watching. I only get stronger as the game goes on. Across time and space I hunt you. I am the human you need. You are excellent. Hail to the king. I will turn the tables. Let the silence of space consume you. Welcome back to the Alienware Lounge here for the last time of the 2019 High Res Expo here at DreamHack Atlanta. Joining me up, I have Pretty Hair, Gormizer, and Finch. And gentlemen, today has been an incredible day of North American Collegiate my championships, Paladins, the World Championships. It's just been an incredible day for all esports. Yeah, we saw both sides of it, didn't we? I mean, back in with, with Paladins, it was in IP, kind of the one you expected to come in that grabs that win. But then here with us in Smite, it's SK, that Cinderella story that grabs the win. I mean, it really just goes to show that, that you can do it any kind of way, I think, on this stage. You just got to come in and show up and be the team that, that, that gets it done. And I'm sentimental as hell. I've been watching Zapman since yeah. the invitation, like early yes. on in 2014. And again, it's just not seeing him win one of these major tournaments. The same thing for Sam. I've been casting him in the past in Friday Night Smites, where it's just like you had nothing and has kind of risen to an MVP at Worlds. It's just so ridiculous to me. I love it. I mean, uh, Smite is how I discovered esports. Zapman is how I discovered Twitch. I thought all Twitch emotes were just like somehow related to Zapman <laughs> in, in some way or another. I mean, this is it's a wild experience, almost full circle for me personally, being such a huge fan of Zapman. Seeing all the parallels even between the Paladins and the Smite events, you guys getting your Cinderella sore, we getting kind of our Titanic finish there with NIP, it's, it's really been one hell of a show. I mean, there's a reason that Zatman was at Worlds and won Worlds and Zatman wasn't. And yeah. it finally comes to fruition here after many years of copy pastas. 
We can finally say that that's true, everyone. I mean, first and foremost, let's start off with what we saw in Paladins today. Run me through the grand finals. It is an incredible start for the Pittsburgh Knights scorer. I mean, you can attest to this, right? This 2-0 start for the boys, the underdogs, the Cinderella story. It, it was looking like it was going to be a real, real easy finish for them, but Ninjas and Pajamas turned it around. I still kind of feel like I'm in the Twilight Zone. Yeah. Because the first set we had this yeah. year was NIP and Knights. Yeah. Knights win the first two maps and then lose four in a row. It's yeah. the exact same play and <laughs> scenario that happened today. Different Uncanny. maps, different champions involved. Yeah. But the fact that it kind of mirrored itself at the end Crazy. still blows my mind. And just think about that. The Knights team has not been together very long, no. right? As they're currently constituted. This run by them, I know that they wanted it. They were that close, but... I can't think of anything else to say except that, that what they did was so impressive here at this event, man. They, they, they really earned everything I think that they got. They took the loss very, very gracefully as well, kind of acknowledging the fact that they're probably going to get it done next year. And Shimon, read through, uh, before we saw the Paladins World Championships, we did see the uh, North American Collegiate League. What exactly happened in that matchup? Yeah, that was Georgia State up against Arizona in, in that matchup. And, and even though the Arizona is a strong school, Georgia State really popped off in that set here earlier today, man. I mean, th those five guys clearly showed up. They even had two members who hadn't been playing with them for very long. I know basically it was one of those ones they added onto that, onto that team. And really everybody on that team performed well as a unit. That's how they were able to overcome Arizona even though they were a strong team, uh, clearly well-deserving champs. It's amazing that they were able to do it. They didn't drop a single map throughout their course for this. So yeah, including today, all the way back. were able to do that. So definitely they deserve to be the winners today, and it seems like Ninjas in Pajamas deserve to be the winners today. And it definitely seemed like SK Gaming going all the way through placements, the seventh seed versus the first seed, where Rival didn't lose a game up until today. What an incredible storyline that we got to be a part of and witness. And I think you heard Sam kind of really address why it is that this team won. And that's because everybody showed up. When he had the MVP trophy in his hand, he said it could have gone to anyone. He was, <laughs> yeah. he was damn right, wasn't Honestly, he? I mean, anybody yeah. could have been the MVP. We were in the green room with all the casters and analysts that were free, and we were trying to decide who does yeah. MVP go towards, and we couldn't decide. Everyone said a different name, didn't they? It's like yeah, someone's like, well, debate. what about Paul? What about Neil? What about Belair or Zap? Or, I mean, Zap in those last yeah. few games? <laughs> Just everyone on that team, I think, really, really stepped up. And, and that's, and, and they been together for so long, right? The only team that came in exactly the same. You could hear Neil Ma speaking to that as well. Clearly a comfortable team playing together. That's right. During the season five world championships, we did see them play as trifecta and even take down the former world championships. But I believe someone said it online. Now that SK Gaming has taken down the world champions, who's, who's going to take down? Yeah, they're going to go out in quarters, I guess, next year, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's the that curse they inherit. That, that man beats that man, so that man could be at Worlds. Is that like a boss? How does it go? I don't even know. <laughs> well, he doesn't do point, any push Cycle's now. broken. So he's going to be set. Cycle's he's back's not going to be big enough. I think enough. Hindu's going to get mad at us giving away this script for Season <laughs> 7, everyone. But we want to thank all of you for joining us here. From day one to day three, this has been an incredible high-res expo for the North American Collegiate League, Paladins World Championships, and the Smite World Championships. This has been... One of the most amazing days that I've ever been able to experience here, and I'm so glad that I get to come back every year. Just like what uh, FDOT was saying, I have been a part of Smite since 2013, watching Zapman on the original Dignitas team at the launch tournament, coming all the way here six years later. It's just good to be a part of it. Nick, any last words? Thank you guys so much for watching. I can't wait for what's next. Four. It was a hell of an event. I loved every minute of it, and I can't wait for next year's. Uh, this crowd brought energy from day one, minute one. One of the best crowds we've ever had. Uh, was just a, I was just honored to be a part of it. And most importantly, thank you guys for watching at home and being a part of us. Sharing on Smite Pro how you enjoyed the Smite World Championships, and we really do hope that you enjoyed it because we all enjoyed it here. Until next time, we'll see you later. Now you won't be there And I just can't ignore that it won't ever be the same